You can drink and do drugs and watch porn. If you still do the shit, that's all that matters. I want to do the formula and then live my life how I want to live. Each of us gets to make a daily choice to play the victim or play the game. And if you're going to play the game, I suggest you play to win. And like all games, life has a set of physics. There are things that work and things that don't work. Your job is to experiment until you find the vein of effectiveness. To that end, I bring you Alex Hormozzi, the man with a proven system for identifying destructive habits and turning success into a repeatable process. You are ridiculously good at writing instruction manuals for how to make money. Literally, you are singular in that way. But if people think poorly or they do dumb things, they are never going to make progress. So what advice do you have for people that are wasting time on things like porn, social media, or even just a friend group that is going nowhere fast? If you, it's my belief that if you can control every one of the variables externally to an organism, you can control its behavior. So one of my favorite quotes from B.F. Skinner, who was a behavior psychologist from way back mm -hmm. in the day was, uh, the old saying is, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. He said, well, if you bleed it out enough and you starve it and you leave it in the sun and you put the water right in front of its mouth, he said, I can veritably guarantee that I can make it drink. And so if you were to think about yourself as that horse, then it's like, okay, well, what is the equivalent of the, the, the bloodletting, the dehydration, the starving that you can put yourself into, get the behavior you want. So starving has a negative connotation, but we can also starve out the negative things in your life. Like you can starve the alcohol, you can starve the porn, you can starve the friends. And I think the easiest way to do that is to get out of the environment you're in. Cause like, um, I'm sure you heard about the, I think this was in atomic habits, um, in Vietnam, like I think it was like 10% of troops or something were taking heroin, um, when they were over there in the seventies and they thought there was going to be this massive problem when they came back to the States. But when they came back to the States, almost no one continued the heroin habit. And so going from Vietnam where you're doing heroin to the US where you're not doing taking heroin had a had a 90% success rate whereas the inverse is true of recovery centers in the United States today. People go there and 90% of them relapse when they go back home. Mm. And so the difference is that people were doing heroin in a different environment and then they changed their environment and then they never went back to the environment that they did heroin in. And so it's like if you have these behaviors that have cues from the people, the surroundings, the colleagues, family, whatever, I think even if you can't afford to move out of the state, like almost anybody can move across town, even 30 minutes away to just make it a little bit more inconvenient for your drug dealer, for your bars that you know, for the friends to say, you know, hey, we're doing fantasy, whatever on Friday. And it's like, ah, I can't make it right. You just make it inconvenient to do all the things that you don't want to do and make it more convenient to do the things that you do and you'll do more of them. All right. So the interesting thing for me about the Vietnam heroin thing, which yeah. I've heard before is and this relates to why I think people might be struggling now, yeah. is there's an underlying thing that's happening that the, the heroin or the yeah. porn or the social media or whatever is trying to mask and sure. cope with. What, what is that today? Like we have things amazing, things yeah. could not be better, yeah. but you've got people doing things to numb themselves out. To, yeah. What's that thing that they're afraid to face? I think it's their perceived judgment, their perception of other people's judgment of their failures that haven't existed yet. And so when you're, when you think about constructing a mindset that is going to allow somebody to be successful, mm -hmm. like when I think about your blueprints, if you had to prep somebody to be ready yeah. to deal with that blueprint, yeah. what are some of the either core beliefs or habits that you would get them in the routine of doing so that they could actually deploy the things that you teach? I think some of the things that I'll say might sound repetitive to some folks, but I'm a big believer in a lot of the stoic virtues. Um, and a lot of that just comes down to having your opinion of yourself be all that is required. And so, um, it's like, it's like living for the future version of yourself and letting that person be your ultimate judge and no one else's voice. And I think that obviously it takes practice. We're social creatures. We learn how to behave from other people and their judgment of our behavior when we're kids. And then we have to unlearn it as we're adults because we find out that the people who are giving us feedback actually have no idea what they're doing. So, <laughs> but like, it's super ingrained in us. And I think it just, it's a, it's a long process, but like, how do I prepare someone for that? It's, it's like, 
everything is removing the limitation, right? It's like, I want to get to here. And so getting there is usually straightforward. It's the obstacles that are all the things that people put in their own way. So it's like, what are, because the obstacle might be have a different name for every person. Mm. And, and then trying to pull apart, like, why is this thing? Like, why am I putting weight on this thing? Because you had a strong drive when you were growing up, right? And you wanted to get into film school, you had this thing, like, I don't know what that snap point is. For me, I just like my fear of disapproval from, you know, my dad was my big was my big driver. And so that was the thing that could get me to quit whatever it was, you know what I mean, to do the one thing that mattered more. And I think that's at least for me, that was I don't know how to find that for someone. You said something in one of the interviews that you were yeah. doing leading up to your book launch that really hit me. Mm -hmm. And that was um, you rewrote the book something like 19 times. Yeah. And when you got to a point one time, where you're like, look, they're going to be able to get this. And the guy that yeah. you were working with said, look, there's a guy yeah. in Iran and he has one goat. Yeah. And he's going to sleep with a copy of this book under his pillow. Yeah. Do it for him. Yeah. And that somehow sparked you. Yeah. So my question is, given your response to that, mm -hmm. given everybody needs that thing, mm -hmm. are there some people that are beyond reach? No, I don't think, I mean, unless you have like mental disability, you know what I mean? Like I think that, that barring biology, right? Um, no, I don't think so. I think, I think I'm a big behavioral person, which is like anything can be trained. Um, even like, ah, oh, man, he has such a great personality. It's like, what is personality? Well, personality is probably 170 individual skills. And so if one of them is when someone walks in the room, you stand up, I can train that. If it means that like when someone's talking, I need you to nod your head like this when the other person talks, mm -hmm. I can train that. And if we just had to make a checklist, it's just because it's hard to describe doesn't mean it's that's impossible to teach. That's interesting. Okay. So the the spark the thing that mm -hmm. causes somebody to finally get into it yeah. um can be translated into a set of behaviors totally and then if you get the set of behaviors then you're going to be in a position to go right All right so um what are some of the behaviors that people are doing now that you think are destructive and what do we replace them with a lot of it is inaction Right. Like it's, I'd love to say like all these people are failing and this is the thing that would fix it. It's like most people just don't take action to begin with. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of it's between their ears, um, to your point, which is why I talk a lot about fear of failure, um, being, being the actual enemy rather than failure itself. And really even like, even the idea that people are like, I'm afraid of failing. No one's afraid of failing. People are afraid of other people's judgment about their failure. If you could fail in private and no one would know, like when you play video games and you lose the level, you're not embarrassed. Right? Like you it's lose. Interesting. So I've heard you say that before yeah. and I've always agreed, Yeah. but I do think that there is something that will chip away at somebody it. So it comes down to what do you build your self-esteem around? This was the yeah. big breakthrough in my life yeah. was the day that I realized I got to choose what I built my self-esteem around. And mm -hmm. I had been building my self-esteem around being smart. And so I was mm -hmm. constantly putting myself in a position where I could prove to myself and others that I was smart. Now I began to realize we are both the shout and the echo, and I mm -hmm. wish it weren't so. I wish we weren't the echo. And what I mean by that is you're what you do, mm -hmm. but you're also what other people say about yeah. what you do. And as a just unimaginably social creature, it is baked so deeply into our DNA. Right. I don't think there's any escaping that. So mm -hmm. you come into, whether it's playing video games or trying to build a business or whatever, with a lifetime of being both the shout and the echo. Yeah. So you have a sense of who you are, you've mapped your self-esteem, and now if part of your self-esteem is, I'm good at this thing, yeah. after a while, like you're way happier to fail in private because yeah. nobody sees you, so there's no new echo reinforcing yeah. what an asshole you are, but I don't think you have unlimited failures on your side before you go, fuck, maybe I'm really not good at this thing, and if your self-esteem is about being good at that thing, then it really will begin to erode you. Mm -hmm. Do you have, a th assuming I'm right about that, do you mm -hmm. have a thing that mm -hmm. you encourage people to build their self-esteem around to avoid the kind of traps that will make them afraid of failure? I think it would be around the traits, which can be evidenced by the things you do, which I think is probably where you made your shift. I'm, ass I'm ass you know, this is me assuming here, but um, like it's not about being intelligent, but about being like hardworking. 
right? It's like if you if you build your identity around that trait, then you can always do more of it. Like you can always work harder. You can always do ex put extra reps in, mm -hmm. etc. Um, and I think if yeah, if people build build that trait as their as their identity and where they get their self esteem from, then it becomes a self reinforcing cycle. But they're the ones who are in control of it rather than the outcome. And so that way, it's like all of the variables of your identity and your self confidence are under your control, which I think is cool. Which is very cool. So mm -hmm. have you identified the trait smorgasbord that people have at their ready to um, be thoughtful about? So for instance, being smart would be a trait, mm -hmm. being honorable, being honest, being hardworking. Mm -hmm. um, what should people be building their self-esteem around? What traits? Is there one? Is there a magic handful? I think the ability to delay gratification and from a behavioral perspective, it's being able to continue to act uh, on a longer extinguish curve, which is like, if longer I knock on a door, so, so if I knock on a door and nothing happens, how many more times do I knock on the door before someone opens? So like, if you, if you, if you fire someone and they're like, wait, I, I, I want my job, right? You can, you can measure what someone's curve on how many times they will try again on something before they move on and give up. Right. And so the longer you can make that curve on someone, the more likely they will hit the jackpot, which then extends how many more times they'll go the next time, which is basically how addiction works too. But you can also use the same concept for good things. Um, so number one is being able to delay gratification. Um, the second one is, uh, I think it's, it's, it's vision of what you actually want to do is like, where do you want to go? Because you can have somebody who works really hard at building a restaurant, like one single store, and you work really hard at building uh, an app that's going to change the world. The amount of hours and effort that go into building an amazing restaurant and that are probably at the, about the same, but the amount of impact is disproportionate on something that can go to gazillions of people. And so I think you have to have some level of vision. Um, and that comes from the people that you're around. The third one is, is having some level of drive. And I think that you can have either pull or, or away from drive. Pick which one, or whichever one you've got more of, I would say start with that one. Um, and I think it does shift over time because many entrepreneurs have away from drive in the beginning. We're afraid of failing. We're afraid of not being enough. You know, we hate being poor, whatever your thing is. Um, a lot of times, especially I get a lot of DMs about this. It's like, I'm trying to find my passion. I'm trying to find my purpose, my thing. And um, I don't think you find it. I think you make it. How do you know if you're going to like anything without trying it? You don't. And most people hate things that they suck at. And how do you stop sucking at stuff? You you do stuff that you suck at a lot until you suck less, until you're eventually good. And so it's like, so, you, so you're not going to be passionate about anything that you suck at, which means that the, it's a fallacy of thinking. I have a hypothesis yeah. that haunts me. And that hypothesis is for real, partly because it applies to me. Uh, that hypothesis is that people have a very hard time holding sophisticated ideas in their head. Part of what I think makes you so amazing and P.S. I would like to say that almost a year ago, I said within the next five years, you'll be one of the biggest uh, names in social media. And I think you, you crushed the timeline just monstrously. Well, you killed the prediction. So. Hey, there it is. <laughs> uh, just really, really um, crazy. But people really have um, just such a, a, a difficult time holding sophisticated ideas mm -hmm. in their head. The thing that makes you as amazing is that you are able to hold sophisticated ideas in your head and simplify them so that people can understand and they can deploy them and actually use them. But the inability to hold the sophisticated idea in their head is going to create a, a tremendous amount of problems. So when I think about, okay, you're going to um, have to pick something for your identity that's going to allow you to face failure, to go into that loop, yeah. to be able to tear yourself down and not have your desire to push forward extinguished, you already have to be able to conceptualize that idea that you're going to be fighting against your neurochemistry. Yeah. So you're going to knock on that door. It is going to be brutal. It's it's going to feel so bad. Like death. And you then have to do mental jujitsu to translate that into, ah, but I build my self-esteem around being the person that can have mm -hmm. this long extinguished that I can knock on a thousand doors when anybody mm -hmm. else can only knock on two. And I worry, God, is my big fear that I do think some people are beyond reach? I think that is my big fear. And I do, impact theory is predicated on the idea that as long as somebody meets minimum requirements, mm -hmm. that they're going to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. But to press on this point, because I'm deeply optimistic. And so <laughs> Lord knows, I hope that you convince me. 
But the more I do this game, the more I realize that people get trapped in things like um, I'm trying to find my passion. Yeah. And that the emotion of nothing feeling real yeah. is, and, and what you have to do to build a connection between I choose to make this my passion and how you make that emotionally resonant is so sophisticated that most people won't be able to pull it off. Yeah. You talk about stacking pennies on the evidence column. Mm -hmm. What evidence do you have for all of us <laughs> that it anybody really can turn uh, a lack of belief into simple rudimentary behavioral things mm -hmm. that they do to get those wins? Yeah. So I'll, I'll make a statement and then I'll, I'll answer that, which is... Um, I think like confidence without evidence is delusion. And so the idea that you aren't confident if you don't feel confident right now is okay because the question is, what are you trying to be confident about? Like confidence as a word, right? So if we can define terms is uh, your the own percent, how the percentage likelihood that you have that what you think will happen or will happen right? Like in statistics, like what is our confidence score on this metric, right? And so the same thing applies to a person. What is our confidence that when Johnny says he will do this, it will happen. And so we have our own confidence metric for ourselves, which is a percentage likely that we will do what we say we're going to do. And so the way that you can increase that confidence is to have more evidence that you've done things when you said you would do them in the past. And so I think it's about looking retrospectively and thinking, you know, what story can I tell around this data that would give me more evidence that I actually do have some of these traits that I didn't think about? And I'll give you a funny little quip on this. So when I was selling weight loss memberships way back in the day, I remember uh, a common thing that would come in uh, would, you know, a lady would come sit down and say, you know, um, I haven't worked out in seven years and I, I know I need to be going to the gym. And I would say, that's amazing. And she, they would just be shocked. They'd be like, what do you mean? And I'd be like, you're so consistent. I was like, so you already have the trait of consistency. I was like, we just have to flip it. I was like, it's way harder to learn to be consistent. Then I was like, if you were just yo-yoing back and forth all the time, I was like, it might be way harder. I was like, but you actually stick with what you, what you said. And they were like, never thought about it like that. And so it's just like, and I say that a little bit tongue in cheek, but to the same degree, it was really just a reframe for these people. And whether or not, you know, people want to take that and run with it in whatever direction they're like, for me, I just wanted this person to believe they could do it. And so I think to the same degree, it's like, well, if every day you didn't make a hundred reach outs, right? Or you didn't make the piece of content that you wanted to, but up until that point, you've always like been able to like make a cup of coffee and like sit down at the computer rather than uh, going to the arcade, you know, figuratively or, you know, uh, playing video games or you going play on video porn. games much to you, Alex. No. <laughs> going to the arcade, boys and girls, back in the 1980s. Yeah. And so, and so it's, it's counting the wins sometimes of, of losses that didn't happen which is like, what, what could have gone worse, which is also a stoic frame, but it's like, what could I have done to mess this day up more than I did? Mm. It's like, well, I could have, I mean, I could have taken five shots when I woke up. I didn't do that. It's like, okay, check. Great. I, okay. I haven't, I haven't started my day with drinking. Uh, ha have I started my day with drugs? No. How many days in a row have I not started my days with drugs, you know, drugs and drinking? It's like, sh I don't know, a whole year. It's like, okay, well, like, let's just basically chunk down a level. And then you see all of a sudden you like peel back the, the onion and you're like, oh, I have tons of evidence that I can be consistent on things. I just need to add another thing on top of those behaviors that I already have proven that I can do. And so now when I make this prediction of my confidence that I can do this, like you just take one step at a time. And I think that the, the big meta skills um, come from those, what we call virtues, but virtues are just behaviors, which can be trained. Mm. Virtues are behaviors that can be trained. It's really interesting, man. I, I very much like the way that you look at the world. And I think I've tried to um, articulate a similar idea. And the way that I approached it was it doesn't matter if you think negatively and yeah. um, act well, you'll still get the success out of acting well. If you act poorly, but think positively, you'll go nowhere. And this is why it drives me crazy when yeah. people's advice is look in the mirror and say that you love yourself and all that. <laughs> It won't work. And at the end of the day, success really is just, it's doing the right things. Totally. Um, uh, another killer. So I, I do look out at the world right now and I see where building products that squeeze our dopamine has created 
amazing products. The iPhone is yeah. incredible and I'm very glad that it exists, but I also see it having a very negative impact on a lot of people that simply uh, pull the dopamine lever. And for people that aren't familiar with, there was a behavioral study done in mice or rats. Uh, and if you let, one, you're putting the mouse in a cage, so you're yeah. already, it's an artificially limited environment. But if you let it tap the lever for cocaine, yeah. it will tap it until it dies. Yeah. Now, the fascinating thing about cocaine is that it's dopamine. It's the basically the potential for, re for reward more than the reward itself. Yeah. And so I think that we have a lot of products that do incredibly well because they're all about squeezing that mm -hmm. dopamine release. And therefore for people to do what you're talking about, like if let's just embrace the frame for the rest of this conversation, and I hope the rest of my life, that truly nobody is beyond this barring, you know, mm -hmm. some, um, a, a mental problem that makes it impossible for them to move forward. So that you really just have to find those behaviors. So if mm -hmm. you understand that the world right now is designed to get you to be watching pornography, to be playing on social media, sure. to play mindless video games, I will say as somebody making video games, I'm, yeah. I'm well aware there there's usefulness yeah. and then there's yeah. is waste. Um, but understanding all of that, that the world is set up against you, then you have to have a technique that's going to allow you to get into these habits that are going to be effective. Now, one thing that was absolutely transformative in my life was to have rules okay. to just a, an absolute binary. And hmm. so um, this, this will be a hot take that will piss some people off. But yeah. I've always said, I do not understand how people get addicted to drugs. Okay. Because if you just have a rule in your life that says, obviously I will exclude pain management. Okay. If you just have a rule in your life that says, I don't, let's take drinking. I don't drink more than twice a week, period. So if you've taken a drink for the third time in the week, you violated your rule, you mm -hmm. know that you're out of bounds, you need to immediately correct course. Do you leverage rules or okay. things, binary things so that you know, like I give myself 10 minutes to get out of bed. That's like my big rule. Do you have anything like that that allows you to? I probably live the exact opposite way. You can reboot your life, your health, even your career, anything you want. All you need is discipline. I can teach you the tactics that I learned while growing a billion dollar business that will allow you to see your goals through. Whether you want better health, stronger relationships, a more successful career, any of that is possible with the mindset and business programs in Impact Theory University. Join the thousands of students who have already accomplished amazing things. Tap now for a free trial and get started today. Not as a contrary point, just um, I, I hate rules, all rules. And so... Um, How do you stay on the right behaviors? I, I do the things that have rewarded me in the past. I mean that genuinely. Like when I wake up earlier, better things have happened for me. When I do more work before I have my meetings, better things have happened for me. When I eat a certain way, I look the way that I want and better things happen for me. And so... Um, I just, I, I buck against rules really hard and I don't know why that is, but, uh, like the moment someone's like, you can't have chocolate or you can't smoke or you can't whatever. I'm like, why not? I'll do it. And then still win at the thing to prove that that's not the point, which is why, like, I get, I get annoyed with, um, a lot of the superstition around, uh, routine. And what I mean by that is like, you know, I've got, I mean, I remember there was a guy who messaged me. He's like, dude, I'm doing my, my morning routine. And he's like, and I have a cold plunge, a red light sauna, I ground outside, and then I do my gratitude journal. And then I like, he was, he had this list. It was like, you know, it was taking him like three hours to get his routine done or whatever in the morning. Um, and I was like, you know, you could just not do that and work for three more hours every day. And I was like, I'll bet you'll make more money. And so I think there's a lot of superstition around, especially in the entrepreneur space around routine as like, if I don't get my morning routine in, I'm just useless. And I'm like, man, I'd love to compete against you. <laughs> right. Cause like you have one bad night of sleep and you're fucked. I was like, I will continue to work because working has worked for me in the past. But I love what you were saying earlier with like success doesn't really care or the result doesn't really care. One plus one, if you still do the addition, it equals two, whether you're a good person or you're a bad person. If you make a hundred calls or you, you know, make a hundred pieces of content, the likelihood that somebody will find out about your product is greater than if you make zero period mm -hmm. fight me. And so you can do those things and be, a ter you, can, you can drink and do drugs and watch porn. If you still do the shit, that's all that matters. Now, those things might make it more, more difficult, but I, I always came in from the perspective of like, I wanna do the formula and then live my life how I wanna live. 
And if that means that sometimes I drink more and sometimes I drink less, or sometimes I work out more and sometimes I work out less, sometimes I eat dessert, sometimes I eat really small desserts, <laughs> um, that's fine. And so I, it's just like, what, like, what are the, what are the actual things that matter? And if you look at, and I know you have a lot of wealthy friends, like people, the way people work, the routines that they have are so varied, which to me means that they don't matter. Because if there were something that absolutely has to be done, then it has to go down to first principles of, okay, in order for people to find out about your stuff, you have to let them know. Great. So you have to advertise it in some way for people to find out about it to buy, period. No, like anybody who has a business, that rule applies. Now, some of them are, you know, don't drink. Some of them drink a ton. Some of them watch porn. Some of them don't watch porn at all and also make tons of money. And so I, I try to have as few rules as possible to give myself as much latitude to live my life. That is, um, that's really interesting. It's and I will, <laughs> no, no, for sure. I love that. And I think that's one of the most interesting things about the era that we're living in is people get all these different perspectives. Um, so for, I, the thing that we agree on is that there are physics to everything. Totally. So success has physics. And if you're not trying to do something that violates physics, then you're going to be fine. And so how you get there is somewhat irrelevant. Yeah. Um, I. I have a feeling speaking to the people that are caught up in the, um, they're, they're wasting their time. They're not doing the things that they need to do. Yeah. They're, they're going to need to create some structure. Now that structure may be as simple as what you're talking about, which is because if, if from my frame of reference, the way that I would put thoughts in my own head about what you're saying is I have a rule and this is a literal rule of mine. I only do and believe that which moves me towards my goals, sure. which sounds very akin to what you're talking about. It's like, if I do this thing, I get this output. Uh, when I wake up early, I've had better things happen. When I'm in shape, better things happen. Yeah. When I put in the work, better things happen. Um, and ultimately, that's the thing that I'm trying to get people to anchor around is their, everything that you do is a test. Mm -hmm your test will have results. It's what I call the physics of progress. So mm -hmm. to make progress, one must have a hypothesis, mm -hmm. know where you are, know where you wanna go, understand the obstacle between you and that, come up with a hypothesis about mm -hmm. how to overcome that obstacle, run that test, look at the data, very frankly, don't BS yourself, sure. and then come up with a more informed hypothesis and try again over and over mm -hmm. and over and over. Uh, but ultimately you're steering by results mm -hmm. and I think very often people either don't know how to, in fact, I think there's a few things that will happen. One, they don't know how to conceive of the problem, so they don't understand the obstacle. Two, they don't know where they're going. Or three, they cannot break themselves out of the dopamine cycle. They haven't identified the pain they're moving away from, whatever insecurity they have. And so they end up in that death loop of um, feeling like they don't have enough time when in reality mm -hmm. they have the same time as hyper efficient, successful people. They just don't use it in the same fashion. I think Seneca said that, um, we all think we don't have enough time, but it's really, we just don't use the time we have well. Um, and I think, I think a lot of it is around like how we, how do, how we choose to pick our identities to, to your point earlier. Like someone might say like, man, I'm lazy. I, I would say like, that's amazing. Like a lot of great CEOs are lazy. That's fine. Um, let's use that. And so let's just make working more convenient than the other thing. And then your laziness will take over. You know what I mean? Just like in terms of how we can frame the problem, right? Like as, a, as an example, we were saying earlier with the iPhone, um, like scientific study, anyone can do this. You can decrease your iPhone usage by simply going to grayscale. Like across age groups, if you switch your colors on your screen to grayscale, you will lose, use it 30% less than you normally would. It's like, great. For most people, that's like an hour plus a day. 30% is an hour plus? Oh my God. Yeah. Whoa. I think it's way, I mean, I think average iPhone usage is probably like, I mean, I think one hour is like conservative on that. I think it's like, like might be even two. Yowza. Yeah. Hours. It's like, there you go. Found your time. You can make all your content. You can do all the stuff. You watch a movie in <laughs> the time that you have from saving it. But like anyone can do it. And so just like how many how many of these little things can I make convenient, right? So like if you're like if you're trying to eat healthy, right? I mean, obviously, guys, like we both came from that space. It's like, well, you just make it more convenient to eat healthy than eat unhealthy. It's like, okay, we'll remove all the stuff in your house that you don't want to be eating. Make sure that all the snacks you have are protein related snacks. Um, you know, anything that has calories in it that's a beverage. Don't include it, right? Like just the just simple things that all of a sudden you're like, I'm hungry, and you're like, you're like, I've got cucumber slices, and uh, and protein chips. You're like, well, what do you think will be more effective, that yeah. or dehydrating the horse? 
I think that is dehydrating the horse. Interesting. That one's never spoken to me. One, because that's not my problem. You can yeah. fill my house with snacks. And if it yeah. either violates one of my rules, yeah. which I'm obsessed with because I created them and they're yeah. designed to get me the results that I want, or they violate my identity, yeah. I'm not going to do it. Yeah. Uh, that's unique to you. I, don't, I, I think that's like a Tom, like 1% thing, just me from the outside. I think a lot of people have a hard time following rules. You don't think people will drive 30 minutes to gorge on something. I think they could, but they're just as likely to break a rule. And I think it'd be, I think it's, it's more likely that they will break a rule because it takes less effort to break the rule to themselves than it does to drive 30 minutes. And so I just want to make it as inconvenient as possible to do the wrong thing and as convenient as possible to do the right thing. That will clearly be advantageous. So in no way is what I'm about to say, arguing against that. <laughs> uh, so huge, love that total yeah. support on board. <laughs> now, uh, having said that, I have a feeling that the thing that people are up against, and, and I thought a lot about this with food. At Quest, I wasn't thinking, oh, I need to make this convenient. That was part of it. And we yeah. certainly were not blind to the fact that giving somebody a package good that they could carry in their purse was going to be really helpful. Yeah. But the mantra I kept saying to myself was, I want to make food that people can choose based on taste. Yeah. And it happens to be good for them. Totally. Because I think people will go way out of their way, violate rules, all that, yeah. uh, to eat something that makes them feel the way they want to feel. And if I had to anchor all of my fears around people not being able to accomplish what they want to accomplish, it would all be around the things you're going to need to do don't feel the way you want them to feel. Hmm. And because they don't feel the way you want them to feel, you veer towards yeah. the things that do make you feel the, the way you want to feel. Now, part of that you can accomplish by reframing, but part of it, I think, is inescapable, mm -hmm. you're going to do what feels good and you're going to avoid what's yeah. painful for the most part. Okay, I love this. So one of the, one of the big misnomers in my opinion around discipline is that people who, who like, some people might look at me and say that, oh, Alex is really disciplined, but I actually really do what I want to do every day. And it just so happens to be work that is productive and, and makes money. But that the statement that you made er earlier that uh, people shoot, what do you said? You said people do what makes them feel the way they want to feel. Right. And then they, they you said, well, oh, it's because it's not making them feel the way they want to feel. And my only addition to that would have just been yet. Just yet. And so it's usually because their extinction curve is too low, right on the behavior. And so if I go, let's say I'm the best door knocker in the world, best door knocking sales guys, and I knock on five doors. I might not get an answer from any of those five doors. And I walk away and I say, I guess door knocking isn't for me. And I might be the LeBron James of door knocking, right? But if the sample size is too small because my extinction curve just cuts off really fast, I'll never know. And so that's why it's like, if, if you can give the thing the opportunity to reinforce its own behavior, then it goes from external to internal, right? Like video editors, for example, like there's people who love, I mean, you, we're going to film school, right? Um, in the beginning, you suck at editing film, but then you like make the, letters appear and you get instant feedback and you're like, whoa, that was rewarding, right? And then you do it again and then you learn another technique and another technique, another technique. And so then the behavior itself becomes rewarding and you begin to like work, right? You begin liking your work. And so I think it really is that just getting over the hump in the beginning of knocking on a thousand doors rather than five and realizing that it would make sense that you would suck because you haven't done it before. Um, but knowing that if other people have done it too, that there is a reward that will eventually come and it will reinforce me just like it has every other human before me who has done this. And I think just like one of my my core, you know, assumptions, um, as I like to say, um, is that if, if somebody else can do these behaviors, I can do these behaviors and get the same outcome. You know, barring external environments or timing and things like that. But, you know, assuming that those are the same, like door knocking to sell solar today is the same as it was last year. And if I see somebody who's number one in solar and I do the same behaviors as them, I will likely get an outcome that is decent. And so I that that's what gives me uh, confidence going into a new environment is modeling somebody and just being like, ignore all of these other things. What are the behaviors? How many times is, you know, is this person, you know, how, how quickly do they walk from door to door? Do they only go to apartment buildings or they, you know, like what's their, what is all the steps that they do operationalizing success um, rather than kind of like the, the theorizing that I feel like happens a lot. And I think that's to be fair. I think the reason a lot of people kind of like some of the content that I put out from a money-making perspective is how can I operationalize this word, right? So like patience, for example, is one that people throw out a lot, but for me, defining patience was helpful, which is figuring out what to do in the meantime. Like that's patience. 
Like we're like, I'm not patient. It's like, no, you just need to figure out what to do in the meantime. That's all. Like you and I are being patient on all the investments that we made last year while we're having this podcast. Like they are happening. We're figuring out what to do in the meantime. So we're being patient. And so it's like patience feels bad when you're focusing on it. But if you're not focusing on it, then patience happens by default. Um, like sadness, for example, like that was really helped me to find, uh, figure out just even defining the word in terms of operational perspective, help me get out of those funks faster, which is um, sadness comes from a lack of options, a perceived lack of options, which is why it feels like hopelessness. But if it comes from a perceived lack of options, then it means that you solve that with knowledge because it's perceived lack of options, which is an ignorance problem, which means it's solvable, which all of a sudden gives me something to do. So then all of a sudden I do have an option and then you can get out of the funk. And like anxiety is the, is the reverse of that, which is I have many options and I don't know which one to pick, which means I don't have priorities. So like you solve sadness through knowledge, you solve anxiety through decisions. And so like helping me just spell those out to myself, I'm like, ah, oh, I feel anxious. Okay, that means that I have lots of paths and I need to make a decision. So which one am I going to decide so I can get out of this bad feeling? If I have sadness, great, what do I not know? Okay, now I have to go figure that out. Great, I have something to do. And so that like it, you can, I think these are like mental models around using emotions to fuel the behaviors that you want. I didn't wanna say a word during that because I think um, what you're talking about is so I'm as as you're talking I'm trying to map um, my fear about people not being able to make the change mm -hmm. um, and I the more I think about it the more I think this boils down to people feel a way that they don't want to feel and they don't know how to handle that yeah and you just without me even thinking to ask you um, you were going through how to deal with different emotions and by having a plan by having a procedure which i think you're going to call operationalizing yeah um then you know what to do oh when i encounter sadness then i do this when i encounter mm -hmm. anxiety then i do this and so it's a very action oriented plan yeah um so i want to plant a flag in that and then i want to follow up with how one goes about um operationalizing something okay so i'm going to lay out a thesis you can yeah. push back or whatever uh people one of the the things that you and I have both said historically that I think is maybe the most powerful thing we will ever say, and everything after that is just what you do once you get over that, uh, your life is an exact reflection of your choices. You are not a victim. And even if you are, it does not help you to think that way. You have to break through that. And um, one of the intros to this episode that I considered was that um, every day, each of us has to make a choice whether we are going to play the victim or play the game. Right. And if you're going to play the game, play to win. It's mm -hmm. the only thing that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But that is um, negative emotions can be so gnarly mm -hmm. that we need to make it somebody else's fault. That to mm -hmm. point all 10 fingers back at us. And this mm -hmm. is one of the things to get hired at impact theory. Mm -hmm. uh, you're going to be asked a question along the lines of something horrible happens to you. How many fingers go outwards and how many fingers point back at you? And the punchline is if all 10 are not coming right back at you, yeah. it's just disempowering. It doesn't mean that bad things don't happen. Sure. Nothing you can do about a tornado, et cetera, yeah, et cetera. Yeah. But still to realize that you can make different choices and get a different outcome. Uh, but people don't do that mm -hmm. a lot because to do that, if you don't have the right frame of reference, mm -hmm. if you haven't leaned on the right traits, yeah. if you aren't building your self-esteem around the right thing, mm -hmm. in that moment to say that it's your fault, 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 mm -hmm. is just emotionally devastating. And people have not operationalized their encounter with negative emotions and therefore they will do anything they have to do completely unconsciously mm -hmm. to not feel that way. Mm -hmm. Now, if that is, uh, doing drugs, they'll do drugs. If that's drinking, masturbation, cheating, whatever, yeah, yeah. they will do all of it. But it really boils down to what's your relationship with your emotion. Mm -hmm. Now to push this farther and to really um, make clear what I think, I don't think emotions are objectively real. I don't think that people ought to believe an emotion. Mm -hmm. I think people think because they feel it, it is the right reaction to objective truth rather than a subjective reaction to perception. Sure. And if you can understand that all of your emotions are a subjective reaction to perception, totally. that mm -hmm. you can take control of that, that you can reframe things, you can have a different emotion. And now in that moment, instead of doing something that moves you away from your goals, yeah. you can replace it with something that moves you towards your goals. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's my thesis 
as, as I really think about boiling it down to what messes people up, it's that. If I'm right about that, how do you operationalize anything? Like, what does mm -hmm. that mean? Because I have a feeling yeah. the thing that makes you phenomenal is the ability to operationalize everything. So if I, I love this the conversation, just a side note. Um, so in my opinion, a, a lot of things, even huge departments, practices in business and medicine and everything come down to learning and communication. And so let's define terms. So learning is same condition, new behavior. So to the point, I felt sad last time I learned this new thing from this podcast on impact theory, which is okay, if I feel sad, then it means that I don't see an option, which means I need to get more uh, education or knowledge on the subject so that I can figure out what to do. Well, at least deciding that I need to learn more gives me the next step that I need to do and boom, I'm not sad. And so you've been sad before and then it took you five days to get out of it and you're sad now and it takes you five minutes to get out of it. Same condition, new behavior. So you learned. And so if we go one degree move from that, and I'm going to circle back to the original point. If we think about intelligence, right? Um, like what is intelligence? As I define it from an operational perspective, it's rate of learning, right? So somebody who learns really slowly is less intelligent. Somebody who learns really quickly is more intelligent. But that means that intelligence is just a rate. It's a measurement of how quickly you change your behavior in the same condition. And so if you continue to listen to podcasts and you wake up in the same exact conditions every day, and your behavior does not change, it means you learned nothing, which means you are not as smart as you think you are. But it also means that you can influence and have a direct influence on your intelligence by increasing or decreasing the time it takes you to actually act on the knowledge you have when the same condition presents itself. And so for me, that's incredibly empowering because it's like I can be smarter by simply hearing what this person says, getting the same condition, and then immediately changing my behavior. Wow, that's cool. And so that then like from the fingers perspective, it's like, okay, all 10 fingers are on me of how I can influence my own surroundings and, and do the things that I want to do. Um, so to, to circle back to um, <laughs> the original question, I think, which I probably dovetailed a little bit um, was, can you repeat it one more time? How do you <laughs> operationalize things? What does that mean? So, okay. So it's breaking down. What does this word mean from a behavior perspective? So it's, 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 it's really hard. Like, I think the reason that so many people are confused and they have a hard time remembering things and understanding complex topics is because they have lots of words in their heads that they have not defined. I really mean, like, I, I truly believe that, which is why every book that I have begins with a definition of terms, which is like, this is what an offer is. This is what a lead is, right? These are, these are what this means, right? Um, and until you have that, you're just, you're basically making face noise. Right? Like if I say leads and you perceive that as something different, then we can't actually have a conversation because we're not talking about the same thing. And so a lot of people have a lot of words they've heard other people say that they nod along to. And some people are like, makes sense? And they say, yes. But when someone says, does that make sense? We have been trained as humans to nod and say, yes. It doesn't mean it makes sense. It means that when we have that cue, that's the behavior we do, right? Because we know that we get punished when we say no, because then it becomes all oh, this big thing. And then, you know, you dovetail into all these other conversations and you get punished for it. Right. And so you learn what's reinforced. And most people say, makes sense. And then you say, which means nod your head when I say this. And you're like, I nod my head. Great. And then you move on. And so I think that's why a lot of people don't learn because they actually don't know what the words mean. And so um, to operationalize something, it is simply going back down to when I say I'm confident, what does that mean? It's not a feeling. It's not a, what other people say about you. Like none of that is measurable. Like how much, like what is measurable? It's a percentage of likelihood that what I say, will happen, will happen, period. That's what it is. Now, what you'll also find is that there are a lot of words that mean the same thing. And that doesn't mean that the, the concept wrong, it's just the fact that English or whatever language you learn usually has a melting pot of like, well, this is the version of the Nordic word, and this is the version of the Hindi word, and this is the version of the French word, and they're all in the lexicon, but most of them more or less mean the same thing. And so getting away from words meaning what the, di the dictionary tells us it means, and just say, what does it mean to me in terms of what I can do with it? then I think makes navigating life a lot simpler because the only thing we can control is our behavior. And so that if we define the words in terms of what we do about it, then these all become things that we can control and, and can change our lives with. Yeah. Okay. That I think is super important. Um, 
one of the things that that changed my life and the easiest way to explain it is how it manifested in my marriage was to define terms mm. and because what lisa and i were realizing is we're saying the same words but we don't mean the same thing totally and that's creating a lot of confusion now as a leader in a business this becomes problematic often because you will say something that to you yeah. is self-evident exactly what it means people do the it doesn't make sense yeah, yeah. nod and um they do that a lot and so lisa and i started defining really simple words like what do, when you say you promise what yeah. does that mean when yeah. you say something's important what does that mean yeah and so like in our marriage if we use the word important it means stop whatever you're doing i don't care if you're with the president of the united states you will immediately get up leave that and deal with this thing because it's important yeah. so if it is meaningful but not important then fair enough it's meaningful but i'm in the middle of something i'll get cool. to it later doesn't mean that it's you know not mm -hmm. something that needs to be addressed but it isn't important cool now we have a shared lexicon yeah um and i think that going back to my thesis around emotions mm -hmm. Emotions are the subconscious's way of communicating to the conscious mind. So when you think about, and this isn't, I mean, this is me making things up. This is me yeah. connecting dots that behavioral science has made abundantly clear, but I am admittedly connecting dots. But uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett wrote a whole book on this called How Emotions Are Made. So this is not me just shooting from the hip, but I'm, I'm putting my own words to it. Um, the, the way that you feel is the subconscious mind, which can process information uh faster and vaster as they say so it's yeah. a a much larger number yeah. of data points process much quicker but when you bring it into the conscious mind you're going to think either in images or in words most people probably think primarily in words and so it really narrows down your ability to um, deal with a lot of information and because emotions um, are coming from the limbic brain, which we had before we had the higher level cognition that humans have that other animals don't have. You're gonna be in a situation where, oh, snake, and you just jump. You just have the emotion and you move. Yeah. Um, most people leave things there. And so they're never pulling that into the light to say, ooh, why do I feel so uncomfortable in this moment? What What is it? And if they would take the time to define mm -hmm. what the discomfort is, then they might be able to operationalize yeah. the response that they should have to this predicated on, at least mm -hmm. from my perspective, what's your goal? Mm -hmm. So I feel some kind of way, but I have a goal. My goal makes demands, which is something I don't think people think about very often. To achieve your goal, just, hey, there's physics to it. So certain things will move you towards your goal and certain things won't. So my goal makes demands, but I feel some kind of way that make me wanna move in the opposite direction of the demands that my goals make. So now, using your words, I have to operationalize my encounter with this emotion, define it, define a response, and then actually adhere to that response in order to move towards my goals. And that the, the moment where you pull the emotion into the spotlight of your conscious attention and define it in a really simple way, I think is where the vast majority of humanity get lost. Mm -hmm. So um, I do something called Impact Theory University and I answer some of the same questions over mm -hmm. and over and over. And they often have to do with that moment. Somebody does not understand their own emotions and therefore mm -hmm. they cannot operationalize the next move. I have so much to say, I will keep it short. Say it so, on, so I wanna, so in reference back to what I was talking about like with sadness and anxiety and patience, like these are all, well, patience is more of a behavior. Sadness is a feeling that, and then how do we translate that, right? Um, I wanna be clear that I use those terms because I want to meet people where they're at. Me personally, and if you look at it from like the, the behavioral science perspective, you have stimulus and you have response. What happens in the box of like what this person feels, right? Like if I hold up a red flashcard to a random person and then I slap them and then I hold the red flashcard again, like all of a sudden, some of them might feel anger. Some of them might feel fear. Like what they feel when they see the stimulus, which I've now paired with a response, right, is going to be different. And so I think a lot of effort goes into people and even people in our world trying to help people describe their feelings, talk through things, blah, blah, blah. And I, I just genuinely think that it's a waste of time because not who cares, but why does it matter? Because you can do it when you're sad, you can do it when you're angry, you can do it when you're fearful. And again, 
to the point is if 100 people more find out about the thing that I'm trying to sell or whatever I'm trying to do, then I'll have a greater percentage likelihood that I will get this outcome. That's it. And I think a lot of people, they just get into this cycle of trying to analyze their feelings. And then they're like, oh, it's because I had this trauma when I was a kid. And, you know, because my dad didn't hug me enough and like, blah, blah, blah. It's like the because for most people's explanation is irrelevant. Because I get like, I had a, a podcast question the other day that asked, um, do you feel like uh, uh, trauma, you know, is, is something that creates success later in life among entrepreneurs, blah, blah, blah. And um, I really thought about it. And I was like, I think people suffer and some people become successful. So do I think that suffering creates success? No, I think that everyone suffers and some of them become successful and then they attribute their success to make it feel worth it to have gone through that suffering because they have an outcome. But I don't think that they're related in any way because like you were successful because you did the thing. How you thought about it is completely irrelevant. And I just think that there's so much effort that gets put into that conversation um, which is why I have really contrarian views around like therapy and things like that. But um, I think like if you keep opening a wound, like what does it help you? I don't know. Like you still didn't make the calls. So like let's 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 create an environment where it's more likely that you create that you do the calls that you need to make. And it just it, it simplifies the variables that we can control because no one knows like even even adding the because to things like I did this because it's like you don't even know why you're doing what you're doing. And so when people are always like, Tom, what's your number one reason for success? We're making it up. We're making up our, our response. I mean, it's what it is. We're like, how do I, there's a hundred things, a zillion things, I don't know. Like, is it because my dad didn't hug me enough? Is it because my mom, like, who knows? Maybe if he would've been president, still would've, it would've been fine. Like, it could be completely irrelevant, but we just choose to give this thing that some percentage of the audience then says, oh, that's like me, and maybe th then I can be successful too. And that's fine, but I think the the, the boiling it down to the absolute basics, or not even basics, the absolute truths of it are that there's a stimulus and there's a response. What happens in the box inside of your head does not matter. If you respond a certain way, you have learned. And if you continue to see the same stimulus and you don't respond the way you want to, you have not learned. So you need to learn. I love how direct and simple that is. See a red card, get slapped, see a red card, duck. Yeah, you learned or block maybe right even better <laughs> right you have preemptively slapped and if i, and I have to show the, the flashcard to you seven ten twelve times the person i show it to once and then ducks the second time is smarter more intelligent than the person i have to show it to ten times before they react in, in a different way than standing there and getting slapped mm. dude i love that um i will i will say for all the people <laughs> that i because the the people that i have um maybe i glom on to because of my own, here's me making up a, a reason that I've gone on to because of my own sort of a, um, the journey that I've had to go totally. on the thing I've had to deal with is that I think where people fall down because you are right. There is no, in no uncertain terms, if upon stimulus, you do the right thing for right. goal attainment, you will attain your goal. Right. Like that's just how it works. Uh, but then the question becomes, why do the vast, 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 vast majority of people never reach their goals. And I think it's because they're not able to either, because either will work, they're not able to either stop caring about what the reason is, um, or they never take the time to figure out the reason. Now, given that I think most people struggle because they just don't have clarity, yeah, I do think people are going to need to, they might not need to f understand why they feel that way, but they're mm -hmm. gonna need the very thing that leaves them uncertain about why they feel that way is the thing that leaves them uncertain about what they want to do with their life or how mm -hmm. to achieve what they want to do. Okay. I really, really I'm gonna, I love this. Okay. So the first part of the statement was uh, people aren't doing the thing. And then it was because, and then the second part of the statement, I would posit that with the because I would put the reason they're not doing the thing that they want to be doing is because they've been rewarded for doing what they're currently doing in the past. And so all they're doing is continuing to do what they have learned works. And so it's like, if you are continually rewarded, because like there's a reason that you do what you do, right? Which is that you have been trained to do it. Now train is a, you know, the environment can train you, which is what most of us switch to over time. You have an external stimuli that wants to pair a new behavior with a stimulus, right? If you want to teach someone to duck, right? You show the red card and eventually they learn, right? Um, but at a certain point, once you, do the red card and then eventually you pair the red card with a fist then all of a sudden uh 
the person gets into fighting, right? And then you don't need to pair that anymore because the environment will self-reinforce and reward the behavior of ducking and will punish if they don't get, if they don't duck, right? And so if you just think about that as like a really simplistic microcosm of how we learn thousands of things, like even, even the concept of, of speech is a million reinforcement points from the time a baby is alive, right? So if you think about a baby as st stimulus response, so they're alive, they make noise, reward, they're here, right? If, uh, attention, affection, approval, right? Reward. And then they make no noise and they make noise again, reward. Make, no make noise again, reward, reward. Then once they learn to make noise consistently, we then start rewarding noise that sounds like words. So it's like, like, hey! right and they're like whoa it's like that's we're not going to reward that one and then all of a sudden they start approximating the first word and so all of it is is this continuous feedback loop of me doing something and it having an extinction curve because nothing happens or me doing something and i get a reward and so that is the that is the micro and so you can apply that to everything that's happened. So like when you, when you start seeing the world in that way, it becomes much simpler to navigate because you don't need to find the reason. You just say like, I do this because I've been rewarded in the past. Cool. So I just need to reward myself in the present for this new behavior. And like, how can I pair this new behavior with something good? Which is like, as a total side note for me, a little trick, like when I go to the gym, I always get a little shake, even though it's a little bit more expensive at the gym, because it's like a little reward that happens immediately after I lift. And I look forward to that. And so it's just like little things that you can do to reward yourself to to hijack that cycle that changes behavior. And so it's like we want to change our behavior. I think we have to define the terms of what behavior is to begin with um, and how we define learning, uh, because that's all it is, is you know, learning is pairing a stimulus with a response. And so if they want to learn things, that's what they have to do. All right. If so many people fail, so many people have a yeah. victim mentality, oh. what reward are they getting that mm -hmm. reinforces that? So it could be that they're, because uh, a reinforcer can be both a more of a positive or less of a negative, right? It's like if I remove a slap, that's a reward in its own way, um, or I add a positive. And so they may be avoiding punishment in certain ways by staying in this place, because in the past, because everything's extrapolations from the past in terms of how we see behavior, because that's our pattern, right? Like we look back at what, like we use our history to make predictions about what's going to happen with, when I, when I try to turn this door knob, to get into the room, I turn it and I turn it because when I have turned doorknobs in the past, it worked. And the first time I encountered a door, I was like, what do I do? Now, what I probably did is I looked at somebody else and when they turned it, the door opened. So I know when I see this thing, now, if I made that thing solid and it can't be turned, I would like, and then I would think what other types of doors are there? And then you'd be like, is there another handle on the store? Like, and so you go to secondary and tertiary behaviors, whereas the most likely one that's going to work is the first one you start with. And so we have these behaviors that let's say laying on the couch and watching Netflix has been rewarded. Watching Netflix is a rewarding experience. It's, I mean, like it's, it's more positive and it avoids negative, but then you get into short-term and long-term reward and punishment, right? Which is why it's harder, um, which is why I think it's the meta skill, which is on top of those things, which is that I know that I can delay a short-term for a long-term payoff. Um, and I think that's where, that's where the big leap has to happen. Because if you can train yourself to know that like, I know that if I do one workout, I'm not going to look different. And I know if I do six workouts, I'm still also probably not going to look different, right? But if I do 600 workouts, I probably will. And as soon as you have that one first thing where you had to delay gratification, you got a much bigger payoff, you start to associate the behaviors in while you're doing it with reward. And so the difference between experts and beginners is that experts find more ways to reward themselves while they work on whatever the thing is. And so it's not that they are more disciplined, which is the, finally the full 360 on this, is that experts are not more disciplined than you. They've just found more ways to win. When you're pushing yourself to reach peak performance, nothing is more frustrating than hitting a plateau, having low energy, or the worst, brain fog. You can overcome those setbacks though with Wild Health. Wild Health is revolutionizing the healthcare industry with genetics-based precision medicine. Premium memberships include over 15 super specialized testing options like a full body MRI or DEXA scan and a full care team dedicated to optimizing your health and improving your well being. Wild Health has clinically proven outcomes with members seeing a 69% reduction in inflammation and a 58% reduction in risk of heart disease. 
Wild Health just opened 10 spots in their premium program for Impact Theory listeners. Visit wildhealth.com slash impact to apply for membership. Reach your peak performance with Wild Health today. So how do we effectively take control of the process of rewarding and punishing ourselves? Yeah to keep us on track towards our goals. I think being cognizant of it at, at, at the absolute base layer, you start to see the world through very different lens. And you're like, okay, that was punishing. Huh, like that was rewarding. Great, I'll do more of that. But then you start to think, you're like, why do I do that? And you really start thinking about it. You're like, well, because I, it's sometimes it's so funny. Like I'll have, um, cause we, you know, we, we, we invest in buying products and whatnot. And so I had two different products that were in the same category. Cause I like the category that I was looking at. And one of the products had a better result like it had a better better end outcome when the, when the customer uses it. And the market leader, and this is who they were trying to disrupt, um, had a slightly inferior result, um, but it delivered the result almost instantly. Mm. And the other one took like five minutes. And this one was like five seconds. And the other one was objectively better. Like even like, sci like science, it had all the stats and everything, like it was objectively better. And they wanted me to invest in this company. And um, they're like, we have a better product. I was like, no, you have a better result you know, better product. The reason these guys are still number one is because uh, latency matters more than intensity when it comes to reward. The reason that a little icon on your phone is because it's immediate, right? And then it goes away, right? Like you have this immediate feedback loop. Whereas, um, you've, I don't know if you've heard this. Okay, so, uh, sorry, I'm, I, I love this stuff. So if you're trying to train a dog, right? They, uh, there's this, uh, I wish I could, I'll maybe send it after the show, but like a graph that shows how you can train a dog to sit or with like a treat. And so if you tell the dog the command and then you wait and you immediately reward it, it learns faster. If you wait 30 seconds, it learns, you know, it takes more tries to get it to learn. After a minute, the dog's untrainable. A minute. And so it doesn't know why it's being rewarded. Now, the thing is, is it's not that you aren't training the dog because whenever you have some sort of reward, you're training it. You're just not training what you think you are. So you have to look at what happened immediately before you give the reward, which happened a minute later, right? And so we think, because it's like, it sat, I'm going to wait a minute and then give it the cookie, but I'm not reinforcing the sitting. I'm reinforcing the thing they did right before they got the cookie. And so as a, as a, as a, as a zoom back out here, um, when we're thinking about, like, and the reason I brought up these two products was that the, 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 the original product, the one that was the, the market leader was better because it gave even a smaller benefit, but it gave it immediately. And so people will probably, it, it seems silly, but when you really try and be honest with yourself, like, why do I, why do I go to this gym instead of that gym? Cause I have a bunch of gym memberships. I'm like, why do I, cause I like to think about this. I'm, I'm like, not surprised by that. Right? I'm like, why do I go to this place? I'm like, cause the other place has better equipment. And I'm like, the person at the front always says hi when I walk in. Immediate reinforcement for walking in the door. And I was like, I think that's what it is. So I like it. Like when I come in, they always say hi. And I have like a two minute conversation and like, I look forward to that. I drive 10 minutes further for that. And I'm like, how silly. But when I think about it, when I'm really honest with myself. And so to go back to the person who's on the couch, it's sometimes the rewards are minuscule. And then when you name them, they feel a little bit less powerful, but it also means that you can say, how can I make another minuscule reward in another direction that gets me moving towards my long-term goal? And then I can kickstart that cycle where I start to learn like a master does because masters enjoy, love the process. It's like easy for a master to say, cause you're fucking good at it. Easy for you to say, right? Like when you're, you know, if I'm right, like I write my 19th draft of the book, I've now written a decent amount. You know what I mean? Like I've, I've spent a long time writing. And so I, the act of writing itself is rewarding for me. But like you must work so hard, which I do, but it's not that I'm willpowering my way the whole way through. Not always. Of course, there's times where it's like not the most fun, but big picture, the process is rewarding because I've gotten good enough that it is rewarding. And so um, the more ways you measure, the more ways you can win, which is like one of our one of our little monikers. And so it's like, how many different ways can we measure so that we can make progress on these little things and have wins as quickly as possible in the direction you're trying to go and then start the loop. Okay. So um, to say that really succinctly to make sure Sorry. I understand. No, no, no. The exploration was amazing. I just want to make sure that I understand it. Um, I think we've covered the reward part. So I'm going to do something measurable and see my growth. And that starts a positive reinforcement loop that's going to send me down the right path. Yeah. 
Okay, so that makes all the sense in the world. Uh, proximity, the rate at which you get the reward is really gonna matter. Yeah. That's really interesting from a product perspective. You're the first person I've ever heard oh, talk yeah. about that. Super interesting. But now how do I punish myself? Do I, like I'm a big believer that you need to punish yourself. But when I say that sentence out loud, I know what people hear and it yeah. feels icky and weird, yeah. um, but it's been incredibly powerful for me. So do you believe in the power of self punishment? Yeah. And if you do, how far do we take it? So um, I will just, uh, just for sake of everyone, I will just state this as my opinion and we'll just leave it at that. So you have praise and you have punishment or you can have reward and you have punishment, whatever you want to call it. Punishment is more effective to change behavior in the short term. Like if I hold a gun to somebody's head, I can immediately change the behavior, right? Reward is more powerful over the long term. And so like, if you look at an environment, so we think we talk a lot about this at acquisition.com because it's kind of part of our mission internally is to create a culture of reward, not punishment. Uh, and the way that we think about this is if you have like, let's say Goldman Sachs or McKinsey, some of these very big organizations that attract some of the best and brightest and are renowned for having relatively terrible or punishing cultures, right? They work people to death and blah, blah, blah. So what happens is if you, if you put an animal in a cage, and uh, they can't escape, then they will revert to the law of least effort. So they will do as little as they can to not get punished. And so then when you're in a punishing environment, you all you have to do to get them to do more is you just raise the bar for what they have to law of least effort do to not get punished. And so in an environment of high performers, that gets everyone to raise the bar, but then quickly burn out. Now that model works if you have an endless supply of bodies. But if you are the person who is being burnt out, then that works for two years or whatever. Praise, on the other hand, or reward can unlock, in my opinion, discretionary effort. So the effort beyond the law of least effort required to keep your job and not get punished. And so the issue is that the people who are the most able are the ones who are able to work the least and still keep their jobs. But they're also the ones who you get the absolute most upside on if they work because they want to not because they have to. And so that is kind of our, our, our thesis of how we try and build companies at acquisition.com. And we're not perfect. We, you know, believe me, there are plenty of times when I want to chew someone's head off, but we really try. I know my team's here nodding, but like, we really put serious effort into saying like, it, so if let's say I, like I find out the dog shits on the, on the carpet when I get home, I hit it. It doesn't learn. All I'm doing is hitting a dog. Like if it was less than, if it was within 60 seconds from the time that it happened, it's not going to learn. And so like, if you know that, and then you hit the dog anyways, what does that make you? Interesting. Right. And so, um, now obviously if we're like punishing ourselves and whatnot, um, that might be somewhat different. I'm talking about how we relate to others. Um, but you can either avoid punishment or you can seek reward. And I think both of them are powerful. Uh, motivators, avoiding punishment is powerful, more powerful in the short term to change behavior. It's faster. Uh, reward is more powerful in the long term to keep behavior going because eventually you, uh, like kind of like hedonic adaptation, you get used to a punishment and then it no longer works. So you have to have, you have to increase the variety and intensity of punishments in order for it to continue to be effective. Do you punish yourself? Honestly, not a ton. I have super high standards, but I don't know if I punish myself. I don't know if I'm like, Alex, you're a piece of shit. I don't, not really. Cause I, you know, Layla and I are kind of sit on opposite sides of the, like, I'm like, some people have like a base of anxiety that they like work through. I don't come from that side. I come from probably like a base of laziness. <laughs> Like, and just, you know, like, and that's why I have, have all these things to get myself to do, to do stuff. Um, but punishment just like, it's also just never been effective for me. Like when I get punished, I, I want to just figure out how to avoid punishment, not do what they want me to do. Right. Like when you, when you use punishment to like train a kid, you get them to sneak out more, right. Um, not like they just find other ways to get out of the house quietly. They don't necessarily change the behavior, but if you reward them for staying, then they never want to leave that kind of idea. The reason people leave when they're younger is because there's more reward outside of the house than inside the house. And so if you want to fix it in the long term, make the reward for being home more than leaving home. 
It's interesting. So uh, this is probably one where defining the term totally. would be very meaningful. Um, I, I personally use what I call self-punishment. Yeah. Now, to me, self-punishment is to force myself to acknowledge that I said I was going to do something that I did not do. That's oh. normally where okay. this will come from. Interesting. Me. I would call that stating the facts. Interesting. I would call that punishing. So, oh, and this, this is, this so, is why this is it's great. important. This so <laughs> I understand why people always react so negatively when I yeah. say that you, you are missing out on an incredibly powerful tool yeah. uh, if you don't punish yourself. Now, just to acknowledge, and you've said this oh, as well, yeah. we, we are all speaking from, this is what works with me. Yeah. Um, so this is the experience that I've had. For the comment section. Exactly. <laughs> uh, and there, so getting out of bed in 10 minutes or less, has, sure. I, I struggle with it every day of my life. It's it's hysterical to me that even now, all these years later, yeah. I still have to be like, you said you'd get out. I stay in bed for like 45 minutes on my phone. I can't allow myself Immediately to. Immediately as soon as I wake well, up. Well, if I, I'm I doing media. something in bed, I, I suppose I should change it to working. Um, that I have 10 minutes to be productive is probably okay. the right way to think okay. about it. Um, and... Because there are times where there's something that I can do in bed, like this morning, when I could start researching you the okay. second I wake up, then then I would still call that a win. But if I don't yeah. do the thing that I said I was going to do, then I force myself to, to acknowledge to myself with no, I don't let myself run. Yeah. So I don't let myself be distracted. I'm just like, you said you were going to do yes. something. You did not do this thing. Yes. And therefore, you should not feel good about the behaviors that you enacted okay. in this moment. Okay. And then I will often confess to my wife or my employees or my community so that I am holding myself accountable. And now I'm sitting in something that I do not like the way that it feels. I'm not letting myself run. And so then I'm like, I don't want to be back here. Yeah. So next time I'm going to take a different set of behaviors. That has been transformative for me so interesting. and that not using that for me yeah, yeah. would be to miss out on a huge motivational factor. i love this and i want to draw similarities for the audience because and i think i think this, this is why i think this stuff's kind of interesting for anybody who's listening is like is there are different ways this is why like there there are only a few things you need to do to win and the way you do it is entirely up to you uh, which is why I love boiling things down to just like, what are the few the few things that everything has in common and everything else is preference. But with what you just said, I think I have like, the first thing we do is we state the facts is that I said that I would wake up within and do something within 10 minutes. Observation, that did not happen. <laughs> then comes the third step, which is that you, um, this is me putting words, okay. is that you label that as bad. And then maybe label yourself as bad, depending on you know that how. I don't do right yeah, for the for the audience. Just to be clear, um, okay, I need to not see you. So one, so if if one wakes you know doesn't wake up in ten minutes and then states the facts, I did not do what I said I was going to do. Um, then uh, labels the the thing as not good, and then says I am also not good. Then that becomes trouble. Now one degree before that is just labeling the behavior as not good or not ideal for the outcome that I want. Um, but I'm not sure how much it matters to feel bad about it. Again, with the behavior box of like stimulus response, because once you feel bad about it, right? And then it's like, well, what, what do we do to increase the likelihood that next time it increases? Now, because we could feel amazing about it, we can feel terrible about it, we can feel neutral about it, but all that will matter is what behavior we change in order to increase the likelihood that we do what we want next time, at least as, as, as I see it. And I found that I put, for me, a lot of energy into trying to understand things, trying to label things as good or bad, trying to label myself as good or bad as a consequence. Um, and the only part that mattered for me to actually get what I wanted was the last step, which is what am I gonna do about it? And I can also just skip these. <laughs> I can just skip these other three steps and just go straight from, I always said I was gonna do this thing, observation I did not do it. What is the change in my behavior or my environment that I'm gonna do next time to increase the likelihood that I do it? And then even with the binary thing that we were talking about earlier with rules, I'm actually more of like a weighing system of, okay, over the last 60 days, I got up within the first 10 minutes, 60% of the time. Okay. Next 60 days, if I can do 70% of the time, I am making progress. And so rather than like, because most people will fall short of perfection. And so I feel like it ends up setting up a, an inevitability of failure if we define it as binary just my own perspective. Mm. 
So how do you then deal with people that are not hitting a standard, whether it's you or somebody else? I yeah. have found in business, if you let people get away with low standards, yeah. uh, not only will it devastate their performance, it will begin to drag down the company totally. and, and it really matters. Totally. So um, do you stick to only rewards? Do you call it yeah. out? Like, what do you do? Yeah, yeah. So, we so we state the facts and then we say what we're going to do about it. And then if someone consistently cannot do, because at, at some level, there's always there's always a chunk down skill someone doesn't have, right? So if I say, hey, can you send an email to so-and-so? We have assumption that they have a stack of skills before that. I assume that they can read. I assume they can write. I assume they can use a computer. I assume they have, from an env environmental perspective, they have access to internet. They know how to use a word processor. Like they know how to open up an internet browser. Like I know we're, this sounds silly, but we make these assumptions. But for some people, they're missing one of those. And so they have all this failure because they're just missing one link on that chain. And so trying to identify what is the skill deficit? And then is it a skill that I'm willing to invest time into teaching somebody? And so we want somebody who have as many base skills as possible that apply to many scenarios. So like if two people go through the same training program, right? And one person gets the outcome, and the other person doesn't, it's usually because the training program doesn't account for every single skill that is required to get the outcome. There are certain assumptions that come in. Like if someone reads my book, I assume that they can speak English. I mean, I'm saying as simple as that sounds, right? But there's a hundred other skills and the people who are successful faster just have more of those skills stacked up so that when they get the right information, they can immediately use it. And some people still need to go back and learn how to wake up on time and like have someone say no and not cry, right? Like these are, these are other skills. And so um, in the environment of work, how do we address somebody who is not performing? We state the facts. We recommend a course of action that can help increase the likelihood that they do it again in the future. And if that doesn't happen, then we say like, this is what will happen as a consequence, neutral of you being good or bad, or this situation be good or bad. It's just, these are the standards that we will accept. And you are beneath those standards based on these facts. That's it. Like if you showed up to work late, okay. Just to be clear, you understand that our expectation is that you show up on time. Yes, I understand. Great. You also understand that, that what you did was not to that expectation. Cool. So let's do this. Do you have an alarm on your phone? Yes. Do you use it? No. Do you know how to set an alarm on your phone? Yes. Great. So why don't we do this from here on out? Let's set two alarms, five minutes apart at this time. That'll give you ample time to get up, clean your face, whatever, and then get on camera. Does that work? Yes. And then we measure. And if it doesn't happen again, if it does, then it's like, why did that? Because then you get into the base skill being, do I adhere to authority? Like, can I listen to instructions? Like those are skills. And if someone nods their head and then doesn't do that, then they don't have that skill. And then the question is whether I'm, am, am I willing to take the time to invest in teaching someone this skill when the opportunity cost of that time could be allocated to somebody else who might already have that skill or suite of skills. That's how we think about it. So one of the things that is a recurring theme is the idea of extending the time to extinguish. What if we were going to operationalize that, mm -hmm. what, what do we do with people and um, if I were going to personify the the length to extinguish, I'll give a yeah. historical example and then I'll give a, a more modern. So historically, uh, Winston Churchill, dude, I don't know if you've read much about him. Unbelievable uh, what that guy was able to pull off and how long he was able to delay gratification. Yeah. And then a more modern example would be a David Goggins. Yeah. So um, how do we operationalize it what do you take from those guys? I think it's the, the the master's thesis of those guys are masters at whatever the thing is. And so they find ways to reward themselves in the meantime. And so we only think that they have supreme ultra discipline willpower because we are measuring what we can see as the outcome of running a race, you know, 26 miles or whatever it is. But if they are rewarding themselves throughout the entire process, then if anything, the end of the race might be uh, a removing of a reward and might be actually anticlimactic, which is what happens with most athletes after they compete in the Olympics or they win the championship or lose the championship. Um, the buildup is where they have all the reinforcement. And then when that thing actually happens, then they have to get right back on the, the horse of where they get their reward from, which is the work to get there because they are good enough at it that they can win in more ways. Mm -hmm. And so just the more you know about something, the better you are at it, the better you are at it, the more you can win, the more you can win, the more you want to do it. How much of that do you think is identity? Like when I look at somebody yeah. like um, a Churchill or a Goggins, it 
that feels to me like a game of who am I or who do I want to be? Mm -hmm. One of my favorite Churchill quotes um, is, well, so quotes, failure is the ability to go from, uh, sorry, success is the ability to go from failure to failure without a loss of enthusiasm speaks directly to this. Yeah. But one thing that I got reading his biography is uh, he said to his mother when he was really young that, uh, this is a paraphrase, not exact quote, but I yearn for a reputation for physical courage um, more than anything. I mean, it was, and and this is a guy that, for people that don't, don't know his story, that sent himself into war zones multiple times in his life when he absolutely did not need to do that, including World War One, when he was, like, he was basically the equivalent, the British equivalent of a senator. Yeah. Now imagine you have an active senator who felt like he had let people down. And so he said, send me to the front lines. And they're like, whoa, why yeah. would we do that? Like you do not need to go to the front lines. Even if you want to engage yeah. with the war, you certainly don't need to go to the front lines. And he said, nope, I want to be literally where the bombs are falling in the dirt with the men. Um, and that was somebody who had such a strong internal compass yeah. of this is who I want to be or yeah. how men ought to be. Sure. Um, same idea with Goggins, right? Just felt like I'm a loser. He's yeah. staring at himself in the mirror, the accountability mirror, doesn't like who he sees, decides he's gonna change and become a different person. And I'm sure you've seen the clips of him screaming, you don't know me, yeah. you don't know who I am. Um, that's an identity play. Mm -hmm. So how do you see that? Is, is ex extending the time to extinguish purely an, an, an identity play or is there something else going on? So I think, uh, I think the wording matters. Um, but if you uh, want to extend how long you continue to do something without seeing the result of your doing, uh, you need to find a way to be rewarded in the meantime. Like that's, that's what it is like that, in my opinion. And so whether we call it identity or we call it a skill or we call it a behavior, or we call it a character trait. So it's saying like with the, the, the many words that ultimately mean like, what is the percentage likelihood that this behavior occurs? Um, that is really all I would look at. And is it as simple as I, I was today who I said I was like, how do we make that? I mean, not to beat to death, the idea totally. of operationalize, but yeah. when I think about what I'm doing, when I reward and punish myself is I am trying to feel the way I want to feel or not, or make sure that I'm feeling discomfort so that I will move away from that behavior. Yeah. So what is it, or how do we leverage identity? to feel the thing that we want to feel like? Is it just yeah. words in your head? Like, how do you play so that game? Identity is really internal culture. So if you think, if you define culture as uh, a set of rules of behavior in a, within an organization, identity is just the rules of behavior within an individual. And so I think to your point, you have your rules of behavior um, that occur. I would say that my rules of behavior, even though I hate rules hate as a rules, concept, yeah. um, when I do these things, like when I see this, this happens, right? I do have the, these, these behaviors that have been cued that I have learned. Um, see, now we have all these words that we've defined. So now we can, at least everybody can agree on what we're talking about, which is why it means a lot to me. Um, but yeah, I just, I think identity is just a big stack of behavioral cues that we've set because people change over time. And so it's really just like a mental construct of this is how I behave. Like what is an identity? It is like, and even if you want to say like, I know this person, what it really means is that I have a high predictive score on what this person will do or say as a result of whatever I do or say. And so if that's the conversation that I'm having with someone, it's like, oh, I know him really well. Oh, he'll love that because I have a good predictive score that when this happens, he will do this. Now, somebody who's all over the place or super erratic, right? Then are, do they have a, a unformed identity or do I just not know enough about them? Maybe. And so I, it just, that has just been my litmus test. And maybe, maybe it seems like oversimplification, but um, for me, it has been incredibly fruitful to just, because then it, for me, it takes a lot of the, the superstition, a lot of the magic, a lot of the black box of feelings and emotions and, and identity out. And it's just, Alex is a series of behaviors. That's who I am, that, I, that have been trained into me by my environment and that I have tried to learn myself. And I will change in the future because if I get better, then it means I can't be the same person I am today, which means some of the things that I have learned now, I will unlearn and learn new behaviors when I see a different stimulus or the same, sorry, when I see the same stimulus. This is so interesting. So um, the way that I have always approached this is I, I am trying to get people to change their frame of reference. 
Frame of reference, Love speaking this. of things that need to be defined, mm -hmm. frame of reference to me are your beliefs and values. Oh, okay. And See, they, I didn't even think that's what you meant. I yeah. thought, I totally thought you meant something different. So this is why we define things. Yes, exactly. Yeah. This is why you define things. Okay. So, um, and, and I will say all of this in what I just heard you say is that where I'm coming at things is from beliefs and values, where you're coming at things is from behaviors and traits. It's very interesting, very interesting. Like I am going to think about this <laughs> so much moving forward uh, as to one, is it, is beliefs and values just particular to me? And that is, I try to help people make change in their life. Yeah. I'm wasting all my fucking time because this is just yeah. the thing that resonates with me or yeah. Is there something I'm yeah. getting to the thing that's underneath your behaviors and traits and that if people don't address this, I'll never get to that. Or I'm just wasting my time. Yeah. You were going to say something. I think it's well, value. So if we were to like when it's like I have these values, a value is just a behavioral short code. When this happens, I do this. Someone who is loyal when he's out and his wife isn't there. Hot girl comes up and says, hey, want to get a drink? Value it means set of behaviors. I say no or I say I'm married or no, thank you, whatever. And so values are skills because you can train them. And That's interesting. Values are skills. I would say the adherence to a value is a skill that you can train. But if you have the wrong value that you adhere to, you're going to be in trouble. Here's why I start with beliefs and values. I think yeah. so much of the human animal is invisible yeah. to the person and that if they, they'll never be able to control their behaviors if they don't control the emotions that drive the behaviors. And I think emotions are an echo of your beliefs and values. And I can change somebody's emotion, like their cognitive, um, the way that they frame something cognitively will drive their biological response to that moment, which is insane. So mm -hmm. the quote, nothing is either good or bad, yeah. but thinking makes it so. Yes. The death of your mother is not good or bad. Totally. Thinking it's yeah. bad makes it bad. Yeah. Now. That is, uh, you and I think come at that from very different angles. Totally. And so- Not a is, bad way, I think it's great. No, 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 yeah. dude, this is so intriguing to me. <laughs> One, because all I care yeah, yeah. about is, are you getting the outcome that you want, yes or no? And if yeah. you are, amazing. And so you're giving me new tools, new ways to think about this. Um, okay, so just a quick yeah. breakdown of, of frame of reference. So my hypothesis is that everybody's life is entirely controlled by their frame of reference. Okay. The frame of reference, the best analogy yeah. would be to say that your frame of reference is a pair of glasses that you put on sure. that distort the living sure. shit out mm -hmm. of the world. That none of us mm -hmm. have the um, option of taking the glasses off. Taking the mm -hmm. glasses off would be to exist outside of your biology. Okay. Nobody's gonna be able to do that. Yeah. So you see the world in a hyper distorted way. Mm -hmm. Now, all of us over a lifetime of reward, punishment, um, oh God, what'd you call it? Approval. Like there's all yeah. kinds of things attention, that happen to you. Approval. Yeah. Attention, attention, affection, affection and approval. approval. Okay. So all of us are getting that constantly from the time that we are born until now. And we choose who to value that from. I and mean, you've talked about your parents yeah. and all that. Like, so anyway, you can choose, but you, most people never become consciously aware of what's happening. And so they the distortion of their lens happens slowly over time in ways that they simply recognize mistakenly as objective truth. Sure. So they think they see the world as it is, mm -hmm. not through the yeah. warped lenses of their frame of reference. Now, once you realize that you can change the way the lenses warp the world, now you can start to shape your lenses based on um, action outcome. Yeah. I did a thing and it had this outcome. And yeah. so it all becomes about your ability to predict the outcome of your actions, which is, yeah. uh, and we will get into sort of the physics of making money but um, to me, that's all about yeah. the ability to predict like what tests to run and how to yeah. interpret the tests and all that. So it ultimately boils down to your frame of reference. And if you don't get your frame of reference right, the world will be so warped, you will not be able to predict the outcome of your behaviors. Most people end up in the mistaken loop of my emotions are the, the correct, which one needs to define and they right. don't. My emotions are the correct response to this stimulus, even though it does not lead me towards my goals and they spend their whole life spiraling in emotion and that's yeah. why they're never able to get out of it and, and begin yeah. to polish the lens in a way that actually gives them um, something useful. And what you're saying is none of that fucking matters. All that matters is whether they do the thing that's going to yield the outcome or not. I think it, it just, I think it just saves a lot of time and a lot of, because 
when we try to name these emotions, like, you know, what am I feeling? I'm kind of, it's like this whole conversation of not this, but like mm -hmm. that self conversation. It's like, what does that accomplish until you then decide to do something in the real world? Like nothing matters. And from a, from an outcome perspective, but I'll just share something with the audience because I have a, my, my first really big viral video was me just talking about like what, how you scale companies. And I, first thing I talk about is scaling the entrepreneur. Um, and I have four frames that I go through in the, in the video. And I used to believe that uh, entrepreneurs get limited by skills. But this is, this is what I used to believe, which is skills, uh, character traits, and beliefs. Those are, that's what I used to say. I now believe that character traits are another way of saying when this happens, they do this, which is trainable, which makes it a skill. And then beliefs are when they are presented with this information, they then make this decision, which is yet again, another thing that can be trained because if you can learn it, then it's a skill, which means it just comes down. as I see the world, it just comes down to skills. And just because it's harder to define, uh, charisma, because it might be 20 things, because we have a term that buckets 50 behaviors or whatever it is, just because it's harder to describe doesn't make it not a skill. And that's why like the soft stuff in business, like we probably agree that the soft stuff matters a ton in building a big company, the culture, right? McKinsey did a big study on this. Layla cites it a lot more than I do because she's usually on the, on the people side. Um, but uh, in a normal business, two out of three strategies fail, like new initiatives fail. In businesses where they have the soft stuff down, one out of three strategies fail. So two out of three succeed. So you get twice the percentage likelihood of success on big strategic initiatives. Do you ever guess why? Why is beyond is beyond me. I th that was just that was the yeah. yeah I don't get into like, because about that. Yeah, I don't get into because it's right. This is that. Yeah, Doctor Cashy's my my closest friend, like a brother. He jokes about he he obsesses about why things work. I just care that it works. <laughs> um, and so, um, anyways, to to circle back on this is that people consider like leadership to be like a foo foo or like communication skills is like soft stuff, right? Sales metric, you know, like we have all these metrics driven things versus this. And it's just because it's harder to measure doesn't make it less important. And that was that was a big realization for me is that it was just because it was harder for me to measure, but it doesn't make it less important. And so these skills that we're talking about, um, we try to find ways to measure them by saying, when I'm, when somebody walks, like, I'll give you an example with our video team. Um, we realized that we have much better direct camera work for our content. If, cause we were, we were like, man, we have this one guy on our team. He's so good to film with. And some of the other guys are just like, not as good. I'm not like as amped about it. Like, why is that? So we could control all the things that we we're going to walk into the, into the video session with like, okay, am I, did I sleep well? Did I, you know, all that stuff. If that's controlled and I still change, then it means there's something in the environment. And so we then observed, actually, to be fair, we asked the, the superstar to observe, what are the things you're doing? And so we noticed that while he's, while he's filming, he's like, yeah, he's like, yes, this is awesome. And so we said, write that down. And then what else do you do? It's like, oh, I, uh, I write down questions while you're talking, while I'm, so he had to be able to multitask. So he had to bob his head while we're talking and write down follow-up questions for what we were saying. And so then all of a sudden it became this continuous flow of consciousness with literally constant reinforcement while we were filming visually. Mm -hmm. And so then we gave that SOP to the other people on the team and all of a sudden filming with them was way better. And so people were like, he's just got a great vibe. It just means that we don't know how to describe all the little behaviors that that person does and, and say, when I start talking, nod your head. Real, right? And when, when there's something that you don't understand, write it down and ask me because I mean, somebody else doesn't understand it too. And it makes for great content. Oh, right. And so we had this big list and then now we operationalized what it's like or what, what, you, what behaviors you have to do to become somebody who's good behind the camera, which means it's a skill that can be learned like charisma, like patience, like confidence, like whatever. And so um, boiling it down that way has just demystified the world for me and just made it a lot easier to navigate because I don't have to spend 90% of my time trying to figure out why I'm doing whatever I'm doing. All I care about is whether I do what I need to do to get the outcome. And if I do the thing and I don't get the outcome, that means there's another variable that I haven't controlled or I don't understand. And if, you know, in the words of BF Skinner, um, if many variables are present, many variables must be studied. So sometimes we want to oversimplify it, but like there might be 10 cues in the environment that create a banger session. But if we have nine, is it better than the last one that had three? Probably. And so then we just make progress in that way. 
Okay, so this is your superpower. This is the thing that, dude, I just look at you in awe. It's, it's really, really incredible what you do. And I am so grateful to live on the timeline where the internet exists and someone like you with this insane ability comes out and just creates all this content. Um, you know, I am as obsessed with learning as you are. And so, um, yeah, it's just in incredible. And to never stop learning is, is the great gift of being a yeah. human. Okay, so the thing that I think that you're just unreasonably good at is taking a very complex problem that maybe I'm spending too much time and the why is this happening and mm -hmm. you're just skipping past that and you're going, okay, I'm gonna break it down into these, do this, when this happens, do this, when that happens, do that. Um, I'm gonna try to get to the physics of business through sure. a weird question, okay. but keep in mind for anybody watching that's that doesn't know my story i i've been in the world of entrepreneurship for over 20 years i've had some pretty incredible success so this is a this is a well-educated question from yeah. i've been in this for a long time so it's going to seem like a weird angle to attack it this is for the audience more than you um hang with me because if we really can dissect this i think it will help people understand the magic thing that you do you rewrote your book completely four times mm -hmm. Something happened when you read it the first time, the first time that you realized I have to start over completely. Yeah. That thing, whatever that was, I promise you, I have the chills just thinking about it. That is the thing that makes you good at business. And so I need to understand what abstract, use the book as an example, sure. but I, I want people to understand this is an abstracted version of something very important, which is you were able, you did a thing, yeah. I'm guessing you had to do the thing in order to find the part that wasn't right, yeah. but you were able to then identify that part, reconceptualize, get more intelligent as you did it again. It's what I call the physics of progress. Yeah. But like what your ability to learn and break into constituent parts is, is the thing certainly I want to learn from. So when you reread what yeah. you first wrote, what clicked, do you remember? Well, I got feedback. So I sent the first, which was really the first draft that I ended up sending to people was V9 um, of the book. Had you rewritten it all yeah. over? Yeah. How many times have you rewritten oh, it by then? So that was like, I had gone through, I mean, I start back at the top, I re-edit everything again, start back at the top. Without feedback. Correct. That's the one I want to know about. Okay. The first time you read through the book, you're yeah. like, ah, I have to reconceive yeah. of the whole approach. Yeah. What happened in that moment? Uh, it wasn't clear or wasn't simple enough. That's, that's it. Like, and um, I like to use this example because it, it might make sense for a lot of the audience. If I were to say, edit a six, assume you know how to edit videos just for the, per, the simplicity. If I said, go edit this video, someone might edit it. And I say, get, you know, edit this video in 30 minutes. And they edit the short clip and they give it back to me. And I say, okay, if I give you two hours, what else would you do? And they're like, oh, well, I might do this, and I might do this, I might do this. I'm like, okay, go do that and come back. And they come back. And I'm like, okay, if I give you two weeks for this 30 second clip, what else would you do? They're like, oh, I might reimagine the entire thing and actually lay it out in this way. It would take way more time, but like, I think it would actually still be better. It's like, cool, do that. And they come back. And then when there's no more loose where I'm like, what else could you do to make this better? At that point, to me, the work is done. I have exhausted my level of skill and understanding. Like I can't make the leads book better at current. Now I'll bet you in a year, I'll think of some things that I could have used to make it better. But at present moment, there's nothing that I can think that I would either cut or add in or break down or add a visual for, uh, or lower the reading level on, uh, to make sure that everyone would understand it. And so whenever I have those, like, it's like a hangnail, you know what I mean? It's like this little splinter where I'm like, this could be better. Does it start with a feeling or with a fact? Um, it's a good question. Uh, I don't know. I think I read something and I think that wasn't as clear as it was in my, it's not as clear reading it as it is in my head. So what's the discrepancy? like this term is confusing or this phrase doesn't make sense or I need to break this into a paragraph or whatever it is. Um, and honestly, it's just doing that. Like it took me, it's funny. I had this this cover letter that I was going to include in every book um, and it was one page. And I think I put uh, 25 hours into the one page. Um, and it's, it's interesting because people hear that and they're like, that's crazy. I'm like, to me, 
25 hours doesn't count as one unit of work yet. Um, <laughs> Thinking like, hundreds. Dude, you got it. Yeah, 100%. Um, and so I ended up actually not using the cover letter, which is even more ironic. Mm -hmm. um, but when my team saw how many iterations went through it, I was like, every single person will read this part. Now, chapter, you know, the last chapter in the book, maybe it's 20% or maybe it's 13% or whatever it is, we'll get to the last chapter. But the first page, every single person who reads the entire book will read that page. Every person who reads half the book will read that page. Every person who reads only the first chapter will read that page. And so it's like, if anything, I should put more time into that. But I approached just about every page of the book that way. It was just that my team was able to see it on one page publicly. And so that's, we, we wrote my editor and I, Dr. Kashi, um, wrote the book because we wanted it to be around in hundred years. And so that was the frame it was like, it has to be, it has to work now. And the easiest way to know if it's going to work in hundred years is does it work hundred years ago? Could someone hundred years ago read this book and it still helped them advertise better? Could someone read this book hundred years ago and help them make an offer that more people say yes to? If the answer is yes, then we pass that litmus test. And that's actually really hard. It's a very simple sentence to say, very hard to do, especially when you're talking about media, content, platforms, like all of these different things. Um, and so I think it's having uh, an exceptionally high bar for what you, what you want to do and having been rewarded in the past, like if this had been my first book, it wouldn't have been as good. But Offers was my first book. And I wrote Offers in one fifth of the time as it took me to write leads because you didn't hold yourself to as high of a standard because you knew what better looked like. I'd never been rewarded for writing a book before. And so once I was rewarded, the amount of time I'm willing to put towards something to get rewarded again extends. So it's like intermittent reinforcement from a behavior perspective. Like that's how you get addicted to the slot machine, whatever. It's like you reward the first time immediately. The next time you reward in 30 seconds, the next time humans have a, have a longer attribution than dogs do just for context. Um, but you can continue to extend reinforcement until eventually you can eliminate it and the, and the behavior will persist, which is kind of cool. Which is very cool. Yeah. Okay. I want to, <laughs> no, I don't know what you're apologizing yeah. for. Okay. So we're at the beginning of uh, what yeah. will hopefully be a magically delicious breakdown of how yeah. Alex Hormozzi, uh, Hormozzi-izes things. Yeah. Okay. So what I took away from that um, is that step one is going to be start with the goal. So when I think about business, um, you need to understand what your goal is because yeah. you're, and this, this goes for life as well, boys and girls. If you do not have your North star, if you yeah. don't know what is guiding everything, then you're going to be adrift. And so when you mm -hmm. think about you and okay, this is definitely me putting my language on you. Totally. Here's how I experienced that first moment. I read something and something feels off. So yeah. for me, it always starts with a feeling. Yeah but I know that feeling translates into a fact. And so I'm going to try to find the fact. Yeah. And so you were saying, mm, this isn't as clear as it could be. And so now you have this North Star. I'm trying to write a book that's going to be around in a hundred years. Again, I'm, I'm maybe connecting dots that don't line up. And so you'll correct me anywhere I go wrong. Uh, we've got the idea of the, the guy with the one goat who's sleeping with this under his pillow, which dude, you cannot imagine how much, A, that makes me like you even more than I already did. Uh, and B, that's so important for people to have like a person that they're thinking about that will make all the fight worth it. Uh, okay, so be around in a hundred years. The guy with the goat needs to really understand this. I read it and because I know what my goal is, I have a feeling, a trained feeling that something is off. That's my, again, this is me. I understand yeah. you're different. Um, <laughs> this is, my feeling is my subconscious speaking to me. It's already picked up on the problem. I can feel it. And now I'm going to translate that into something. What I really need people to understand is uh, you're going to take all of Alex's advice and you're still going to fail. And the reason you're going to fail is because you're not yet good at the thing that you're good at, which is um, finding the fact and saying, oh, this is the very thing that's broken. Now, as you have said, so I'll just channel you for a second. You're, you're going to suck at this for a while, but don't worry. Oh. Just keep doing it and yeah. you will get better at identifying the fact. Okay. Yeah. Given how much you're nodding, I'm going to assume so far I'm on the right track here. Uh, so how do you, yeah, exactly, right? Uh, how do you identify that fact? So what is, is it just repetition? You've just yeah. done it a thousand times. Yeah. So you can either have, uh, basically it's called contingency-based reinforcement, which is the environment corrects you, right? You put the thing on the market, no one buys it, no one watches it, whatever it is, right? Um, the other is that you get feedback from somebody who has more knowledge than you. And so you can either have a person give you direct feedback on, you know, listens to your sales call and says, hey, you know, try this next time. Um, and ideally, that's where the feedback loop is like, if, if I have a one-on-one -on -one with somebody and I give them that feedback a week later, 
it's much more powerful to be there an hour after the call, like the moment the call's over, and even more powerful if you're sitting there with them and you can be like, say like this. And then you get the feedback loops way faster because they'll remember it because they'll be in the moment of trying to learn. Like, so if we're trying to teach sales, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back, but if, uh, if we're trying to teach sales because we've got three brick and mortar chains in our portfolio, um, teaching frontline sales, like very transactional, like front desk, walks in, go here, whatever. If you train them offsite, which is what most companies do, then they will remember it better offsite than onsite. So you wanna train them in the environment that they have to do the behavior because they'll have environmental cues while they're learning. Just like if you if you study for a test, if you can study in the actual chair that you're gonna take the test in, you'll remember more of your answers. What? Oh, for sure. What? Yeah, if you ever, have you ever uh, been on the phone and like had some conversation and then you walk the same path a week later? Yeah. And then as you see a tree, you're like, oh yeah, I was thinking about, because it's, because you learn and you the have mind trigger. palace idea, right. geography. That's right. interesting. Actually, now that you say that, it makes a lot of sense. I wonder if it's different for guys. I don't want to derail us. Yeah, yeah. All good. Guys have spatial memory. Yeah. <laughs> uh, interesting. All right. Step one, we'll start with the goal. We went through that. Identify the fact. Yeah. Okay. How oh, do we feedback. get contingency versus uh, versus individual? So either, either your environment uh, gives you that feedback because it didn't work or somebody who knows more and has done it before multiple times can recognize the pattern for you. So when you uh, say like, find the fact, I would have just, the only thing I would have maybe tweaked on the earlier uh, preface was uh, the feeling is because of pattern recognition. I know this isn't right because it hasn't been right. It looks like something that hasn't been right again in the past. And we always have something called successive approximation. So like- Success of? Successive approximation, mm -hmm. right? Like uh, girls named Tiffany are crazy, right? And I meet a second girl Tiffany's named Tiffany- blowing up the feed right now. Right, <laughs> yes. Second girl named Tiffany, uh, also crazy, but looks different. But I'm like, wait a second, I know Tiffany's, you're all crazy, right? Like, so you have a successor product, like you learn, it's a silly example, but um, that is like, that's how we can generalize learning. And um, the bigger, the, the more depth you have in terms of the principles around any skill, the more you can generalize learnings from one thing to another. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Pattern recognition, huge. Yeah. Uh, getting people to help you short circuit yes. that, huge. Okay, so, um, getting into the reinforcement yeah what i want to understand is um how uh i'm gonna ask it yeah. and then we'll see if i think i know the answer <laughs> but um the real thing you're trying to figure out when you're doing the testing is what would need to change yeah. in order for this to work yeah um the reason I say it like that is because the language I would have naturally used is why didn't this work? Yeah. But you don't care about why. You yeah. just want to know what would I have to change in order to get this to work? How do you, we'd use experts if they're available. Sure. Uh, but if we're just testing, let's yeah. say we have to brute force this. How do you go through that? You, uh, I've heard you say the number of tests that I thought were going to crush yeah. and they just absolutely <laughs> tank. Yeah. So you, you thought you had it and yeah. all you get is an answer that says no. Yeah. So all you have is no. Yeah. How do you turn that no into a new action item? Yeah. So um, I think it's breaking down didn't work from binary to a continuum. So it's not it didn't work. It's it didn't work well enough. And so that's a huge one when it comes to like running ads, making cold call, whatever it is to get customers, whatever you want to do. It's not yes or no. It's how well. Right. And that just says it's an easier frame. And so then you have to go, at least from my perspective, you break it down to first principles of, OK, what has to happen? for someone to buy. It's like, well, so that's just a whole lump of psychology right there. Behaviors. They have to see it. They don't see it or hear it. They will not buy it because they won't know you exist. Okay. That so and that luckily, like within the marketing world, because that's what the book is about is measurable. Like, did the impression get displayed? Did the email get delivered? That is you can see that on any any platform. The next one is like, did they engage with it? So that's a behavior they engaged, which would be they opened the email or they opened the email and clicked the link inside of my email. Um, they clicked the ad to then get to you know the landing page, whatever it is. So they engaged to a degree. Um, the next you know the next thing is that they're going to like in order for me to contact them in the future, then I need to have some way to contact them. So they have to give that to me. Um, if I don't already have it, like an outbound thing, you'd already have their contact information. You want to reply. If you're running an ad, then they need to give you the contact information so that you can reach out to them. Um, but it's really breaking down. Forget what they think. Forget what they feel. Like I, I wholeheartedly reject the like. There are seven stages of awareness. It's like how the fuck do you know? Like, well, 
they have to have a desire. And then it's like, how many people have bought things without desire? Tons. All we know is that when they see this thing, they take their wallet out and they purchase, period. Right? And the same thing with like a sales script. Like I truly believe that if you knew every single variable that it took for somebody to buy, you get 100% of people to buy. Now, the problem is that we don't have every variable every time for every person. And so we do the best approximation we can to hit as many of those piano keys to get them to purchase, right? And so that is how I, that's how I approach all of them, whether it's, you know, what do I figure out what to sell, which is the offers book? Uh, who do I sell it to, which is the leads book? Um, and then, you know, future books will answer one singular question. And the leads book was fundamentally, like, and the reason it's called leads instead of advertising is because I test advertising versus leads and leads beat advertising. Even though the book is fundamentally about advertising and to define advertising, it's the process of making known. And so did I make it known? Great, I advertised. Like she advertised that she was with that guy all last night. You're like, oh, she, met, she let it be known, right? She made people aware. And so there's only four ways you can do that, right? You can do one-on-one -on -one and you can do one-to-many. Like I can tell you one-on-one -on -one in an environment where no one else can see me, or I can put it on a bulletin board. Worked a thousand years ago, works today. Uh, and then I can do that in public or I can do that in private. So you've got, sorry, I just repeated the same. Uh, you can do that to people who know you and people who don't know you. So you've got one-to-one -to, -one to people who know you, which is warm reach outs. You've got one-to-one -to, -one to people who don't know you, which is cold reach outs. You've got uh, one-to-many to people who know you, which is making content to your audience. And then you've got one-to-many to, one to, -many to people who don't know you, which is paid ads. You rent other people's audiences and you display your thing. You let them know about your stuff. And so break it down that way. Like there's no other way that someone will buy unless they find out about you. Period. Fight me. No one, like, no one can fight that. And that's basically what the process of writing these books comes down to is I want to make a series of statements that are, that are beyond reproach so that no one can argue with them. Like you, you cannot get someone to buy unless they have given you a way to contact them. So like you, you walk down that, that logic tree and then you figure out which of these didn't happen. So I ran an ad and I didn't make money. Well, there's like a hundred things that have to happen between then, between them seeing it and them giving you money. So we just look at, and we start at the front because if you don't get to the third step, there's no point in trying to fix the third step because you haven't gotten people to even click. And so the first thing, you know, we'll talk about is like, how do we create a hook? How do we create a headline that people, that will capture someone's attention? That's it. And then from there, it's like, if you master that part or get good enough at that part, then you move to the second part. And I, this has worked very well for me because then it demystifies the concept of success. And I stopped judging myself as being a good or bad. It's just like, how likely is the thing that I did here, get them to move to the next step? Okay. How likely is it if I show this thing, they get to move to the next step and you just keep going until eventually you're like, oh, wait, I made money. And then you have all the, the pieces together and then you do as many times as you can. All right. It's going to actually first let me address something. So uh, to say things that are beyond reproach, that's what you said. I want to make sure that I'm saying things that are beyond reproach. Yeah. Uh, to me, it's like another way of saying it's got to all be first principles. 100%. Cool. Makes sense. So you're trying to boil things down to this is true. Does not matter what people say, think, believe. Ah, it just is true. Okay. Yeah. That I think is critically important for anybody that wants to scale a business. Um, you believe that we live in a deterministic universe. Okay. I actually don't even know what that means. Okay. So cause and effect, pure okay. and simple. Sure. billiard balls bouncing around a table yeah. that behaviors are the the cause of a behavior is knowable uh i wouldn't i'd say there is a cause of the behavior i don't know if we can know it necessarily we can try and control as many of the environmental factors but i don't know if we can say this is why well i'm trying to avoid this okay is yeah, why yeah, so that, yeah, yeah and get to uh if if the cause and effect uh, god is that a pure why okay <laughs> For, for Alex, I'm yeah. going to disagree with you violently based cool. on your own principles. Cool. Uh, that none of what you do would work if it couldn't be known what you needed to do to elicit a given response. Otherwise, everything would be entirely random. And so what I think you know and what makes you so good at overcoming sales objections is that you know if I can get them... Oh God, I don't know how you so would explain it. So the difference but, between knowing why and knowing that so this is cool. Okay. I just care about that. And so this conversation, I know that if mm -hmm. I say these 12 questions, yes. when this person walks in the door, the likelihood that they will buy is 38%. Do I know why they buy? No. Yeah. I know that if I do these things, this will happen. Perfect. 
deterministic. Okay. So uh, <laughs> that that helps me yeah. to understand how you go about doing this. So it seems to me what you were doing is you were trying to map behavioral cause and effect, which is why at the beginning of the episode, you even said, like, oh, I'm really into behavioral uh, psychology. Is the, I think behavioral it's psychology. The, perfect. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a personal obsession of mine, because I also believe that we live in a deterministic universe, which calls into question free will. We're going to set that aside for now. Yeah. Uh, and so oh, it totally does. Do you think that free will exists? Less and less by the day. Yeah. I, I think eventually we all get to the point where it's like, it can't. Yeah. Then you exist. get into very interesting questions about morality. Yes. Right. Which we won't get into. Correct. Yeah. At least not now, maybe at the, <laughs> yeah. at the end. But yeah. It's okay if you kill somebody, if it's temporary insanity, but uh -huh. if it was premeditated, it's bad. But to what, so where do we draw the line of, okay, that means that there was environmental conditions that made this person act in this way that they wouldn't otherwise do. But it's like, were there not environmental conditions that created the person that, that trained these behaviors that then created the murder? Correct. I'll just, I'll just but I'll now <laughs> as, as marketers, if, if we can understand, <laughs> money, right. <laughs> right? if we can understand <laughs> what triggers behaviors, yeah. Now, now the, you can truly predict and execute because ultimately yeah. that's what this game yeah. is. And the feedback loop that I think people either know about you or intuit about you is that you're really good at this process. I did a thing. It did not yield the results that I wanted. And I was very shrewd about the next thing that I tried and getting people shrewd about, cause there's going to be. 10, it's really 10,000. There's going to be a lot of things that you could do when the first thing comes back and you only got 38% of what you were looking for and you want to get as close to 100 as you can. So being able to do the next most logical thing, mm -hmm. logic as defined as I have a goal and this is the thing most likely yeah. to get me closest to it, um, the ability to do that rapidly, yeah. I will, I don't know if you'll agree with this, but I'll add bolt on to your definition of intelligence. Okay. That if you're... Um, you said the rate, rate of, of which learning. you change your behavior yep. is is the definition of intelligence. I will say yeah, the the rate at which you can identify the the most meaningful next step or the most likely to be mm -hmm. successful next step is also uh, intelligence. Not that that really matters, but this is the game people are yeah. playing. And I would this, say it chunks up. What does that mean? So uh, the rate so learning is defined by similar condition new behavior, right? Mm -hmm. And so if I have a fast rate of learning means that I have a new behavior that I do in that condition, the only way I can have that new behavior is have some sort of knowledge. So I think it chunks up to the same. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. I see what you're saying. Um, Prerequisite. So, right. So if these two are the same idea manifesting in slightly different ways as you come back down, um, that I think is what people are learning from you and why you're so effective. Um, so the, the question becomes, do you have a methodology for identifying the next most useful test to run? Or is it true? This is all just going to come back to the same answer, experts and repetition. It is. And then um, I did try to create a, an operationalized version of that from a funnel perspective, because I realized that some people don't have the money or whatever to test more times they need to you know, succeed faster. And so I operate off the theory of constraints, meaning that every system is constrained in some way. And then if you simply identify what the constraint is and deconstrain it, it will grow until its ne next natural constraint. Can you give me a concrete example? Um, let's say you, uh, you've got a, a, a Shopify store that sells uh, coffee mugs. Uh, and you spend $1,000 a month and you make $3,000 back uh, on, on the mugs. So the constraint of the system at some point will either be I run out of mugs, that could be the constraint. Uh, it could be that I just need to spend more money because that might be the constraint today. And then I spend enough that I run out of mugs or I spend enough that my cost per impression exceeds my profit because I go to colder and colder audiences. So then the constraint there might be like, I need to build a brand or I need to get trusted sources to increase the likely, the, increase the awareness, let more people know about my stuff so that when they do see my ad, they're more likely to make the purchase. Um, and so it, it's really being able to accurately identify what the constraint is. And so for me, uh, when I walk this through the book, I said, usually uh, the constraint that I will focus on in a funnel uh, is usually the one that has uh, the largest incremental, has the largest throughput difference with the smallest incremental change. And so it's like if I have, uh, you know, 50% of people who are scheduling 
uh, 30% of people who are showing, or let's say 25% of people are showing, and then you know 30% of people are closing. It's like, okay, if I'm looking at these things, which one am I going to attack? Well, I'll probably attack the 25% show rate because if I get a 10% uh, or 25% increase, just for math's sake, uh, I would double the throughput. If I increase my schedule rate from 50 to 75, which is a 25% increase from an absolute perspective, um, I would only have a relative difference of 50%. So I would make, I would get more bang for my buck by focusing on the constraint, which is the one that the smallest incremental improvement increases the throughput the most. And that you can use math to find out. Yeah, this is, um, th this is business for people listening. So my obsession is helping people understand how to solve novel problems. Not problems you've never heard of before, problems no one has ever heard totally. of before. And this is where you have to get down to first principles thinking. Anything that can be turned into math should be uh, something that we talk a lot about here. Right. Oh, cool. Yeah, so uh, because then you're pulling it out of the realm of emotions. I know I've been talking a lot about emotions, but um, I'm only trying to identify that as a as a predictive mechanism for the next thing, sure. which may be just where you and I um, don't see the world the same. So for me, to understand what the next smartest thing is, you think you think uh, behavior behavior. What's the behavior I need to do that may be more useful, and I will really be thinking about this after this um, discussion. The way that I've always thought about it is if I can understand the psychology in that moment, I'll be oh, able yeah. to predict the behavior. Right. Um, so maybe wasted time or maybe necessary, maybe you intuit it. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Time will tell on that. But um, it's it's very, very interesting. Okay, so people are, um, they need a rubric by which they figure out what the next thing that they need to test is. You've just offered one, which is to understand the limiting factor. Mm -hmm. When you understand the limiting factor, um, then you're able to think mathematically and remove said limiting factor, or at least know where to um, approach that problem. I think that's incredibly helpful. Um, as So when you're explaining all this, I your business model at acquisition.com is a pure understanding of even though you're able to, even though you're willing to give all of your secrets away, mm -hmm. there's still gonna be a gap in execution. Sure. Why? Why are you better at this than most people? Um, I've done it more times. That's it. Yeah. You really believe that? Yeah, I've done it a lot of times. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a big part of it. And then I think that there are elements that we have that are kind of competitive modes, which we purposefully um, set up. Like we are building this brand so that we can attract the best talent. So like if you have, let's say, a chain of nail salons, right? Which is a company I'm, I'm looking at investing in right now. Um, so if you're listening to this, you're great. Love your company. Um, and and so you have a chain of nail salons and you will probably struggle to get A-plus talent to go to that. I will not struggle to get A-plus talent to place for you because they will want to work in an acquisition.com company because they know there's a huge backing behind it. They know that we're going to be shooting big. We're going to try and do big stuff. And they might think the founder might be a first time founder of getting to a business of that size, but we are not. And so they have a higher likelihood. We have, they have a higher confidence that we will help the business grow to a much higher degree, meaning that their career can grow. They have more opportunities. It'll build their resume, all that kind of stuff. And so from a competitive moat perspective, we're able to get better people. And if we get better people, we build better companies. And then that becomes a flywheel because the more companies we take on, the more we grow, the more success stories we have, the more talent wants to come and it just it just continues to feed itself. And that's something that continues to compound in time. And that's purposely built as a long-term competitive advantage. Okay, talk to me about leverage. I think that's an important part of this puzzle. So yeah. there's a couple moments in your story around leverage. Um, one is, is the guy that told you, hey, you shouldn't be in the gym business. Yeah. You should be teaching people how to do this. Yeah. Uh, and then the other moment, at least for me yeah. on the outside, um, was when you realized, I'm not going to help these guys launch their businesses, so I'm going to sell them the course that I put together. Yeah. Um, what's the, what is leverage? Why does it matter? And how do people get some? Okay. So first off, just for the, just for the audience, um, it was much closer to a franchise than a course. Uh, so it was, it was a licensing model. So we had, it was more, it was closer to licensing plus services than it was a course just because it would just do, a, we don't even sell courses. So like, I think that that's because there's a lot of people in that space that follow my stuff. And so they make that assumption, um, mm -hmm. which is fine. And I only set the record straight for, for clarities. Um, beyond that, um, leverage as we define it is the difference between what you put in and what you get out. And so if I, uh, and it's volume times leverage equals output. 
So it's how many times you do something times how much you get for each time you do it equals output. So if I do 100 sales calls and I have no skill, then I will get fewer, scale, fewer sales than somebody who does the same 100 sales calls and has much higher skill. So skills create leverage. You get more for what you put in at a simple, at a, at a, at a basic level. Um, but it works with anything. So if you're trying to invest, it's like if I can invest a smaller amount of money and get a bigger return, then I have more leverage, right? The reason debt is considered leverage is because you can put 20% of the cash in and get 80% as a loan. And you buy a building five times bigger than you normally could. So you get more for what you put in. Um, and so there are degrees of leverage, and this is wholeheartedly taken from Naval. Um, and I'll probably have to think more about it because I haven't written the book on leverage yet, so I'm borrowing. Um, but I, I remember it as the four C's. He has different words for it, but you've got collaboration, capital, code, and content. Those are the four C's of leverage. Um, like we make this video right now, we make this podcast, and we put X amount of effort in, but we get unlimited upside on it. Many millions of people can see it, or one person can see it, but. We get more for what we put in, the better and better we get at this. Uh, code, you can write you can write an app one time and then unlimited amount of people can use the code or use the app. Uh, collaboration is I say, okay, I will now teach 20 guys to sell and I will get 10 times the output that I had if I were selling. And so I might not take any sales calls, but make more sales than anybody else does because I have more leverage. Um, and so a big you know through line of the leads book is there's the core four, which is the first four things that I explained to you, one-on-one, one-to-many, uh, strangers and friends, or people who know you, people who don't. And then the other four, which are the four lead getters, people who let other people know on your behalf, which by their very nature have more leverage because you don't have to do it. So if you can get your customers to tell other customers about your stuff using the core four, because they also have to use that. Like a customer can only tell a customer by telling somebody through warm, warm outreach, posting content about it, running an ad, unlikely, and doing cold outreach, also unlikely. But they could do one of those four things. And that's complete, that completes the advertising cycle. So you do something to get a lead getter who then does the core four and around and around you go. So I could also make ads to get affiliates who then run ads to get customers for me. But if I uh, go and spend, let's say I spend all my time and I get 10 sales a month um, of customers, right? And let's say each customer is worth $1,000 uh, to me. Great. I'm going to cap at $10,000 a month. If I use the same effort, of marketing and sales, and I sell 10 affiliates. So still, still same number of conversations, same number of humans, but I sell 10 affiliates per month. And then those affiliates each month after that get me one customer each. Well, then the first month I'll get $10,000 because each one of those guys got me a customer. But then I'm still gonna work and get another 10 affiliates next month. So then next month I'm gonna have last month's 10 plus this month's 10. So now I'll have 20 new customers. And if I do it again, I have 30 new customers. And so I am using the same amount of work to get more customers than I did if I directly went through it. And so that is that is a basic example of how leverage works uh, within the context of advertising to get customers in a business. Mm. So what is the what is the way that you think about um, constructing a a business or the way that you're going to structure something. So when I first asked that question about leverage, you you said something really interesting, which was, hey, I just want to point out to everybody that that yeah. was a licensing model. Yeah. It meant something to you to make a, a distinction there, yeah. which I have a feeling there's there's a little bit of Hormozy sauce in there that we would all benefit from understanding. What, what yeah. drove that decision? Why does that matter to you? You mean saying that? structuring the business to be so um this is exactly what went through my head when yeah. you said that was oh shit like he actually had a more keen moment of understanding than has come across at least to me and i've heard you tell that story multiple times um and i've heard you say oh it was a licensing thing but it never i don't know it never landed for me but this time i realized it really meant something to you um so there was a keen insight there what what was the keen insight why why do it as a licensed model instead of just saying oh this is the course go use it If we added assistance and services where we would maybe run the ads for them and we would train their sales teams, which we do, um, and we would give them the ads to run for their local area and we would help them build the landing pages to attract customers and we would uh, give them the white label, you know, meal plans, grocery list, fruit, fruit preparation, you know, instructions for their clients. If we do all of those things, then we would increase the likelihood that they would succeed and make more money. 
and I can charge based on the a fraction of the value that I can produce for the majority of my customers. And so if the average, so right now gym launch, still a company, still continues to grow. Um, the average uh, gym lord, which is what we call the community. Gym lord? Lord, yeah, lording. Um, the average gym lord uh, adds $200,000. I want to say, shoot, I have to know the metric. A lot. Yeah, it adds, it, it, this is it, there we go. Uh, adds $200,000 a year um, to their business and 100,000 of that's profit. There, there, that's what the, the math is. So the average gym lord adds $100,000 a year in profit. I think it's a little bit more, it's like 118, whatever. And we can charge a percentage of the increased net profit that we are help we are able to help them generate on average. Mm. And now we have to usually charge a significant uh, discount on that because half the people are gonna be below the average. So for the people who are, for, for half of them, it's an even crazier deal. You know, I mean, they, they, they pay for the license model. They don't have to spend money to test ads. We would say, we already spent 50 grand in 20 markets. These are the winning ads this month. And they could just run them through the system and then just collect the money on the other side. And so they get the speed and they don't have to have, they don't have to taste the test, you know, the, the, the failed ad test because we would incur that cost, but we were able to distribute that cost at scale. So no individual gym owner could spend $50,000 to test ads in all these different markets. We could, and then give it to a thousand gyms. And so, th and again, from a media perspective, uh, leverage, we could do that one time and a thousand gyms can do it at no incremental cost to us. And so it is a very profitable business. It still is a very profitable business. All right, when you had that moment, and I'm sure people know this part of your story, you had the moment where you're fucking desperate, you've yeah. lost everything twice, you're yeah. scrambling to make money, and yeah. you tell the guy, I'm just gonna give him a number that's high yeah. so that he doesn't bother me with it. Uh, six grand, he's like, yes. Yeah. Had you already thought of it as a license model, or you do those first, like whatever, 150 grand that you made uh, with the seven people or something, I forget the exact details of the story, but it was like seven people that you'd promised to yeah. do their gym and instead you sell them this model. Yeah. Had you already thought of it in that moment as a licensed play? I had, um, I just, I think honestly, a lot of, a lot of the, the words around like what we did came from outside sources because people saw how quickly we grew and we were in a world that was direct response marketing. And so many people in that world sell courses. So they use the words that they know how to describe something. Mm. Um, but it was much closer and arguably like significantly more support than what a franchise does for a franchisee. And that's how we structured. I wanted to be, I wanted to provide more service, make them more money for a lower fee than a franchise would. And potentially this is smarter. And um, I'm really, my goal in this part of the interview is to help people map the models that you have running in your head that allow you to do the things that you do. Um, because even from my perspective, it's very unique. It's very rare. You just have a, a real ability to break things down to what I'll call the essence of the thing. Um, the Anybody listening, I will tell you right now, the biggest mistake you're gonna make is what I'll call a category error. People yeah. fail to understand what the true essence of the thing is, um, which I am as guilty of as anybody, so I don't put myself um, outside of this, but have spent a lot of time trying to understand my own failings and shortcomings. Um, so as I'm hearing you tell the story, I'm thinking, okay, one, to identify the license thing is very shrewd, and so, trying to map how you conceptualize the thing feels tied to me to the, the same idea of um, understanding that an individual gym cannot afford to do the market testing that you can afford to do. And therefore, if you do it, you now have a moat, you have leverage, you have a service that you can sell. That is understanding the true nature of the beast. Yeah. Do you ever stop and model the, na the nature of this thing is and yeah. then you break into constituent parts. Yeah. What does that process look like? And is it universal or yeah. is it nail salon nature of, mm -hmm. uh, gym nature of? Yeah. Um, I, I boil it down to something probably hilariously simple, uh, which is number of potential units sold times gross profit. That that's, and then, and then the, you know, the tertiary pieces, what upfront or capital investments required to be able to, that would enable that, right? Like if I had, if I had to go buy a machine that could manufacture widgets that have, you know, phenomenal margins, because the value that people get from it is, you know, $10 and I can make them for 10 cents, then that's a, you know, great business. But if I can only sell it to, you know, one town in Alaska, because it's a really unique fishing tool that only works in their environment, uh, there's elements of that that would make it an attractive business, but there's elements that won't. So it's like, it'd probably be a very small, very profitable business that could not scale. Um, nothing wrong with that. 
there's definitely a huge place in the economy for things like that. Um, but when I'm looking at opportunities, that's what I would, that is the simplest way um, of looking at it for me is number of potential units sold, uh, gross profit per unit, and then what I'll call competitive dynamics as the, as the third part, which is like, if you look at, you know, cell phones, it's like, what does it cost them to add another cell phone to this massive network? Probably not a lot. Is it really sticky? Yes. Do people stay and pay for a long time? Yes. Okay. So there's probably a lot of gross profit to be made there. Um, and do, how many people need, you know, cell phone service a lot, right? It's like, okay, so that might be really attractive, but the competitive dynamics is that I would have to have, I don't know, a billion dollars, or I'd have to partner with somebody that would allow me to white label. So this is when you get into the competitive dynamics of like, okay, well, is there, is there value in creating a brand and wrapping on top of an existing solution and say, Hey, I might be better at marketing and sales than you. And you already have the infrastructure to deliver cell phone services to people nationwide, or maybe just in this region. Um, and I will do what I'm good at and you deliver on the back end and we structure some sort of deal where, you know, the more volume I get, the more of the economics I get to, you know, participate in. So those are kind of the, the, the big three variables that I look at if I'm just trying to analyze a business uh, in terms of opportunity. And the, and the big piece that I think a, a lot of folks will miss out on is when I say uh, gross profit, um, I'm talking lifetime gross profit. And so that's where like, I have less care about recurring versus not recurring. Um, you know, if, from a, and this gets into the push and pull of selling a business or not selling a business. But you know, if, if, uh, if a company has something that's super recurring, let's say it's a service like accounting or bookkeeping, and let's say there's really high, you know, gross profits on that because we've automated a ton and we've got some uh, offshore workers doing, you know, the remainder of it. We have really amazing margins and it's really sticky. Um, that could be a super high gross profit business. But at the same time, if you're Elon Musk and you sell everyone a Tesla, and even if everyone buys one Tesla, that might be still more gross profit than, you know, the bookkeeping services just as a completely contrasting example. Um, and so I just look at what is the lifetime gross profit. And some of that might be better structured for recurring and some of it might be better structured for a one-time transaction. Um, and then I know I'm going into like stuff that will probably bore the audience, but if you're looking at the business as a product, then it, then it also becomes, you have two customers. You have the customer that you're selling a product to, and then you have the customer that you're gonna sell a company to. Um, and most customers who are investors who are buying companies feel better <laughs> buying something that is recurring in nature uh, because then they feel that the likelihood that they, it will continue to make money in the future is higher. Even if the TAM's huge, all that stuff, it, they still feel they sleep better on it. And so you get a premium for the company. Um, and so that's, that's kind of big picture how we think through what companies we want to invest in, uh, or at least the opportunities that we could look at. And then from a personal investing perspective is how much value can we add to that specifically? Like I probably wouldn't take on a wireless cell phone company likely but if there's a you know a brick and mortar chain of services that's like med spas or beauty or you know health and fit like that's my wheelhouse like we know how to crush those and so it decreases my risk because i know that even from a value add perspective if i can 5x the company because i know how to how to build those marketing and sales processes at scale at the unit level then the likelihood that i don't get a tremendous return is really low mm. Okay, there's two things um, there. One, sorry, that's a little quick. No, no, no. This is this is amazing, and I, I hope people are taking this as it's intended. So, in fact, let me uh, let me give people a frame of reference. This is the way that you should be thinking about what we're talking about right now, which is um, all of these things abstract, so that you can think through novel problems. And so, big data sets with a few filters, so you can make quick decisions on massive amounts of data. What do you mean by that in terms of what we're talking about right now? So if I, if I, so if, if I, so we, I get every day on my phone, I'll have a list of all the companies that have applied at acquisition.com and they'll be ranked in terms of like, this one looks the most interesting. These ones are less interesting. And here's why we didn't think they were interesting for my team. And so I will basically go pass, 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 second call and ask these things. And then they'll go and do that. Um, for me to be able to quickly make the decision because otherwise I would I would be inundated with the amount of data that I have to take in. I have to have filters that are faster. Just LTV to CAC ratio. Like I feel like you can boil down most businesses to what does it cost you to get a customer? What do you make from that customer over the lifetime? Period. That's it. Now Tam is, you know, how many of those customers can you sell short? But like if I just had if I could only look at one metric in a business, that's what I would look at. Okay, so most of the entrepreneurs that are listening to this or that people that want to be an entrepreneur, no, I think they'll get that, but they're, that's not where they're going to be at in their journey. That's yeah. certainly a more advanced thing. Um, so the part that I want to 
yeah. bring you back to is they're gonna they're they're going to be thinking through how do I start a business? Sure. What business do I start? Sure. Um, how do I identify the opportunity? And so there's a couple things that you were just going through that I think are really relevant. One of them is how you identify the business model. Mm -hmm. So um, looking at a total addressable market, uh, lifetime value of the customer versus what it costs you to get them, all 100% they will have to figure that out or they're going to end up doing something dumb, chasing a small opportunity, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but the all of those metrics will change based on the decision that they make around what business model to pursue. So I'll just by way of what a business yeah. model is, uh, selling courses, that's one business model. Sure. Licensing a business is another business model. So uh, people you're saying, even when they try to retell your story, they are confusing the two. So, uh, but very different when it comes yeah. to execution. There's no uh, recurring course yeah, model. Those just, <laughs> just wildly different. Note, right? <laughs> so um, how do you process through if if you were starting, so mm -hmm. not as when you're looking to acquire, how do you process through what is the right business model to pursue? So this is pulled from my $100 million offers book, which goes, the point of that book was to answer the question, what do I sell? And I think that a lot of people, especially when you're starting out, you're like, I need a business plan. I need a, I don't think any business I've had has had a business plan as an aside. Um, it's just, what are we going to sell and how are we going to get customers? And then from there, we build everything around it. And so, um, isn't that a business plan? <laughs> I have two things on my plan. <laughs> I mean, I've seen like 16 page business plans. Right, and I'm like, right, okay, right. all these numbers are made up. It doesn't matter. Like, do you know how to get customers? Um, and so picking the avatar, which is the customer that you want to go after, and then picking the problem that you want to solve for them. And problem you want to solve is I feel like kind of a trite term in the in an entrepreneur space. Um, but you usually want to make their lives easier in some way. Uh, it's usually going to track down a status or it's going to track down a time, right? Like those are, those are two huge buckets that, that can, that cover a lot of stuff. And, you know, different people say there's health, wealth and, and relationships. There's, you know, there's a million bigger buckets that you can try and chunk this stuff into. But if you are starting out, so let me just get you really tactical. So we were just really clouds for a second. Let me just get you tactical. Number one, you can go and set up all of your autos of incorporation, your LLC, and all that stuff online with a few clicks of a button in under 30 minutes. So you do that as step one. Step two, you take those papers to a bank and you get a bank account. Step three, you hook up a payment processor to that bank account, which is, again, a series of clicks that nowadays are almost automated. Once you have those three things, you get a stranger to give you money in exchange for doing something for them. And so I would categorize businesses as I see them, usually as you either sell products you sell services, so physical products, something like a mug, right? You sell services, you do something that they would otherwise have to do for them. You write software that does something that a human would do for them, but because you have an auto, you have automation with code, uh, you can get them to do it, or you create things that entertain people that they wanna have access to. And so those basically function into media. Again, you've got people, products, uh, code, and, and, uh, and, 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 and content. So it actually breaks out to those four types of businesses. And I think that most people, if you have no, like, let's say you aren't a software developer, right? And you want to start a business. Uh, the easiest ones to start are either, the easiest one to start is a service business because it only requires your time and you to learn a skill that other people can also learn, but some people just might not want to do it. And that is all you need to solve. And I remember like when I was in college and I, I spoke at uh, some universities for uh, for entrepreneurship and everyone there is always like, here's my business idea, right? And it's always like weird gidgets, uh, widgets and gizmos and like these, these never before seen businesses. And most of those will fail. Whereas like, if you want to make your first business and the big fallacy is that the first is going to be the forever business, which it won't. Most entrepreneurs have many businesses over their career and each business you learn elements that help you build a bigger and better business the next time. And so you start with something that people already buy. So it's like, you can look, what do people already buy? They already buy lawn care services. They could mow their lawn. They just choose not to. They could optimize their website for SEO. They just choose not to. They could run their own ads. They just choose not to. They could edit their own videos. They just choose not to. You could set up email, you know, autoresponders for people, but they choose not to. You could set up voicemails for businesses and, and transcribe it and send it to them because for those people, it saves them time. And so you can pick any problem you want that someone already does or already purchases, look at the solutions, and you can literally just do it the same way and have a way to get customers. 
That's it. Like that's, that's it. You just reach out to people that you know, one-on-one, you reach out to strangers, one-on-one, you make content about the problem and you run ads. Those are the only four things that you can do to let other people know about your stuff. So once you decide what you have to sell, you then use the core four, one of them pick, and then you let people know about it until eventually someone says, yeah, I'd be interested in you solving that problem for me. Mm. And that's how you make your first dollar. All right. Focus becomes the problem. People end up getting really scattered. They want to try a bunch of different things and see what sticks. Um, how, how do you make focus work for you and not against you? I feel like focus can only work for you. Um, I guess lack of focus is the nightmare scenario. (laughs) Most people spend their time in. Yeah. I think it's, um, so I love showing this visual, uh, and maybe we can grab it at post for this, but if you imagine a curve, right, where you go, uh, you start here a little bit above the line at uninformed optimism is that you see your buddies doing drop shipping and he's making money. And so you're like, wow, this must be amazing. I will do that too. So then you leave your current opportunity to do, or maybe you start and you start doing that. Then you move to stage two. So you go over the hump of excitement and then you go to informed pessimism. Now you're below the line. Then you're like, wow, okay, you have, there's a lot of other stuff. It's really competitive. I don't have a brand. It's hard to differentiate. You know, the cost of goods is actually continuing to rise. And so are ad costs. And, blah, blah, and you start realizing the other things that you didn't know before. So you have a, a slightly more realistic view of the opportunity. Then you go to stage three, which is the value of despair, where you're like, nothing's working. I don't know what I'm doing. And this point is where everyone then jumps to uninformed optimism and the next opportunity. And they repeat, repeat. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, until they're eventually able to learn that they just need to stomach because every single business has shit. And when the grass is green on the other side, it's because there's lots of manure there, right? Same as yours. And then you go up to informed optimism and then you hit achievement. And so those are the five stages that I see most entrepreneurs going through and they continue to cycle the first three over and over again until they learn the lesson so this is a skill, focus is a skill. I can train someone to do it. Um, if you're in the same environment and you're at this point where you're not sure what to do, but other people have succeeded at this thing, and then you think something else is easier that you find out about, that is a stimulus that we can then say, here's the red flash card. Are you going to duck or are you gonna get slapped? And realistically, most people just need to keep getting slapped until eventually they realize that nothing is going to be easy and they have to go through the period of not knowing what they're doing. Because that's like that in essence is what entrepreneurship feels like is uncertainty of whether or not all of the time that you've put in is actually going to work out. And you have to get really comfortable with that, is that you won't know. Because if you were to be guaranteed the outcome that you're going to get what you want, you wouldn't want to do it to begin with because everyone would already be doing it because it's already guaranteed, which means the opportunity is gone. Mm -hmm. So the opportunity is in the uncertainty. And so as long as you can embrace that, which is why you have to have some tolerance for risk as an entrepreneur, because you have to pay down your tax of ignorance, which we all have to pay down every single day for not knowing the things we should know. Um, and the only way you do, you pay down that tax is that you test and you iterate. And so you just want to get as many no's out of the way, as many failures out of the way, because you're not actually failing. You made progress. It wasn't yes or no. Did it work or not? It's how well did it work? And I think if you can make even that frame shift, you're like, okay, well, I'm reaching out to people. They're responding, but I'm not getting them on the phone. Okay, well, then you have a scripting issue. Okay, then you get them on the phone. Okay, well, they're not buying. Okay, well, then it might be an offer issue. It still might be a sales issue. Depends on why they're not buying. If they're saying, you know, it's price, it's like you might be mispriced, but you also might just be really terrible at explaining the value. And so you just continue to work your way down until eventually someone's like, yeah, that sounds good. And they read you their credit card or the phone and you're like, holy shit, this is actually happening. And you make your first dollar. And I promise you, if you make your first dollar, the second one comes a hundred times faster than the first one did. If there are many variables present, many variables must be tested. Is must be studied. Yep. Must be studied. Yeah, uh, that is certainly uh, marketing <laughs> summed up. Yeah, there no doubt uh, that people are going to have a hard time figuring that out. Um, I want to better understand. You just did a book launch for um, your most recent book, and it. I mean, you set records. It was unreal. I mean, really like blew people's minds, set a standard in in the world of online marketing. Um, what was it about that, that, or what did you demonstrate in the way that you did that, that other people don't understand? So with each book, I wanted to demonstrate the concept of the book with the book itself. And so offers, when I released it, it was uh, $1.99. I've now since made it free. Um, but it was $1.99 on Kindle. It had a course that went with it that many people charge $5,000 or $10,000 for. Um, and it was the subheadline of the book and offer so good people feel stupid saying no. And so I actually 
launched that book with a single post when I had 10,000 followers on Instagram. That's it. And every month after the first month, it continued to sell more and more copies. And to this day, it continues to sell more copies every month. And that is based on the offer being exceptional and people sharing it because they got tremendous value relative to what they paid. That was the that is the entire concept of the book. The, the core framework of that book is is called the the value equation, um, which I won't get into. But that is basically people say the word value, but how do you operationalize value, right? And so that book is about operationalizing value, making the thing that you currently sell more valuable in the perception of the customer, so they're willing to trade more of their money for it. The leads book had an entirely different core concept, which was the core four and the four lead getters. And that is the advertising cycle. And so it's how do you let other people know about your stuff? And so the sub headline of that book was how to get strangers to want to buy your stuff. Now, to be fair, it's not it's not how to get strangers to buy your stuff because that's sales, but how to get them to want to buy your stuff is advertising. And so this book sits literally just between they don't know who you are and they show interest. And that's where the book ends. You get lots of leads saying, I'm interested. I'd like to find out more about your stuff. And that's all I could fit in one book to make it actually effective and operational for most people. And so since the concept of the book was to advertise and to get lots of leads, then I thought it would be appropriate to advertise and get lots of leads. And I used every method in the book, all eight for the book launch, even though I could just have made a post on my, you know, across all my social medias and probably sold plenty of books just doing that. But I wanted to show that this stuff works today and it will work in a hundred years and it worked a hundred years ago. And so I went through, I had some people that I reached out to one-on-one -on -one purposely just to check the box. I reached out to some cold people so I could do podcasts. I uh, ran ads for it, even though I didn't need to run ads. And we still got 137,000 people from ads. Uh, we had affiliates. We got 104,000 people there from affiliates. Uh, we had 27,000 affiliates promote the book. Um, we had customer referrals, people sent their friends there. So I had an incentive that if you just get 10 people to come, you'll get two bonus chapters that aren't released with the book. Uh, affiliates, uh, which is the, the, another lead getter, right? I mentioned it earlier, but, uh, affiliates, uh, we got them, uh, to, to promote the book. We got agencies who actually were the ones who ran the ads for us because we don't run ads at hold go because we don't transact. Um, and then, uh, employees, which is the fourth type of lead getter, which is they do the core four on your behalf for you. So we had Mosey Media, which is our internal content team, um, made all the content and the ads for that matter uh, for the event and the book itself. And so I actually only did uh, 17 long, uh, 17 short form pieces of content and six long form pieces of content. And then that got cut into uh, 143 posts that we did over six weeks uh, on top of the 2200 posts that we were making anyways uh, over that same period of time. And so I used all the methods in the book to demonstrate, to give proof that the book works. And so, you know, the next book, I'll try and continue that meta theme of, I have concepts in this book and I will show you that they work because I will use them to market and promote the book. Mm. The thing that I really want to make sure that people understand, and if you think I'm crazy, definitely <laughs> let me know, but I doubt you will. Um, the reason that all of that worked so well isn't what you did at the time. It's what you did for the years mm -hmm. leading up to that moment, uh, building brand, uh, building awareness, generating massive amounts of goodwill. Um, is that like what amount of magnification did the whatever four ish years leading up to the launch of that book play in the, the launches success? It was everything. I mean, it was everything. Now, that being said, you could still absolutely use it. Like you can still use warm outreach. You can still use cold outreach. You can still like, and one of the concepts in the book is making content. And I talk about how I structure content, how we pick topics, how we pick headlines, how we format it, how we do all those things so that people can use that and make content for themselves. Um, but usually the longer you can wait um, before making any ask, and to be fair, the, I gave the book for free. And if, if you wanted to buy a physical copy, you could. That was the whole, that was, let me, let me self spoil it. The surprise of the launch was that I gave everything away for free and said, if they want to buy a physical copy, you could. Um, I'm, I can't wait to write the book on brand because I have a lot of thoughts on it and I can't wait to have really clearly crystallized, like, un, you know, beyond reproach ideas about brand. Um, but I'll give you a working teaser for, for how it works. But brand is basically teaching. It's associating something people know with something they don't know. And we associate these things enough that eventually I can remove this and then you'll associate water with my hand. And so if I do that enough times and I have, you know, water and, you know, coffee and whatever, then you might generalize and say the hand is a beverage thing, right? And 
I like thinking about it that way because what do I want people to associate me with? I want people to associate me with tremendous value. I want people to associate me with long-term goodwill. I want them to associate me with money, right? So every book's $100 million or something, offers $100 million leads. Um, and so I want them to associate me with investing, which is what a lot of the stories that I talk about are companies that we've invested in and that we owned and scaled or exited. And so I, we do those things so that when you have a brand, a brand is put on something to direct someone's behavior. It is a, is a physical sign. So if you look at the you know original, the origins of the word brand, it was a brand, you put it on a cow, right? And so if you have a cow that doesn't have a brand and a cow that does have a brand, you will behave differently with a cow that has a brand on it. You're not gonna go capture it. You're not gonna go kill it. You might return it to its neighbor, its neighbor or whatever, like the brand changes your behavior. And so brands have, at least as far as I'm concerned, like these, you know, I haven't written the book yet, but um, have kind of two, two continuums. You have the strength of the brand, and then you have the positive or negative uh, inclination towards it. So away or towards. So like Nazis, for example, have a very strong brand <laughs> away for most people. Now, to be fair, there's You're also right. a subset of people who are strong super strong brand. towards. There is people a subset of people some who- some kind of way. Right. It changes their behavior. Yes, it does. Right? And then and the inclination says towards or away to some degree. Um, you know, Donald Trump has a strong brand, right? For many no people, it's for, for a percentage of the population, it's it's uh, negative, and for a percentage of the population, it's, it's positive, right? And so when we think about brands that way, it's been helpful for me because you really answer the question, who and what do I want to associate myself with? And then by doing that, eventually, your logo and your identity will then have a set of things that people associate with which then will change their behavior, which is why I think brands are the most valuable things that you can build because it really becomes a way to influence the behavior of the masses at scale. And so if every single person recognizes the Nike swoosh and I can take a water bottle and then put a Nike swoosh on it and triple how much I can charge for it and still get more people to buy it, then you can measure the strength of the brand by the difference in price between the commoditized version of it and the branded version of it. And that translates into tremendous profits from a from a capitalistic perspective. And so if you're trying to build something really valuable, then you make many associations that are positive for a specific audience. Because uh, I think Black Rifle Coffee, right? They're kind of like politically charged-ish, right? So Black Rifle Coffee is going to be really positive for people who are probably right-leaning uh, in terms of their associations with that brand. It'll probably be kind of negative for the, the people who are more left-leaning. And that's okay because they're like, we can sell to half the population, whatever. And so I'm, I'm kind of uh, agnostic to the direction of it. And obviously Nazis negative on that. But like for, for most of these things, I'm just looking at what is, what is the percentage likelihood that people will adhere or comply with the requests that the brand makes of them? Buy my thing, go to this thing, whatever. And so that is the, that's why you can have somebody who has a huge brand in terms of uh, the amount of people who are aware of it, but have very low ability to direct or change behavior. And so you probably, I'm sure you know this better than anyone, with Quest, you guys were one of the first ones getting into the influencer space, like way back way back when the term influencer was a new term. Mm. Um, and you probably saw some people with million person accounts and they couldn't drive any sales. And then you saw somebody with 15,000 and crushed it because they had a stronger brand for a narrower audience, even if it was just like a, a girl cop who has an audience of all girl cops, they might have lots of positive associations with that person and then be more likely to you know comply with whatever request they have and so i know this is a, a branding discussion um but the reason that i think many people wanted to come to the event is because they were rewarded in the past for consuming content for reading my last book and so they felt like the likelihood that i was going to reward them again at this event would be high and i try to like i'll tell you a secret i try to make many promises and keep all of them. And the more times you can make promises and keep promises, the higher the likelihood people will ascribe to you for being somebody who is predictable in a good way. If he said this will happen, this is what's going to happen. If he said it's going to be worth it, it's going to be worth it. And so that was woven in for the 24 months from the time I released offers to the time we did leads was trying to actively build up the goodwill so that um, we could set records and do something really cool and demonstrate the concepts in the book in the real world so that people could know that it would work for them too. Mm. No, I mean, it's incredible. It's breathtaking um, what you guys were able to do. What was a record that you broke? So the Guinness Book of World Records for a business virtual conference live was 21,000. 
for business conference. So you absolutely yeah, it. demolished yeah. that, which is really cool. That's awesome. But I, the, I will say this as an aside. Uh, I think the, 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 the fanfare about the launch will decrease soonish. And I think that the actual contents of the book is going to be the thing that that can that people that is that machine will start spinning because inside of the book referrals is always the one that i always try and drive the most in any business i have because it's the lowest cost to acquire customers not that it's a customer acquisition thing for me but um or sorry not a money-making thing for me <laughs> books are not the best way to make money just throw that out there um but it can create a viral effect so that you can get more customers every month without paying a cost to acquire and so the mission of acquisition.com is to make real business education accessible for everyone and so in order to do that i can't do it alone and so that is why I have to have other people help me. Yeah, uh, you're only gonna scale as much as you can get high quality people to help you, that's for sure. There was something fascinating that happened during your launch, um, which I would love to hear from a guy who did not in the beginning consider himself a salesperson, somebody that has uh, gotten very good at sales. Yeah. And as I was saying in our first interview, which the funny thing is I ended up um, taking you on a side tangent before you answered it, but I said, the world does not think you're creepy. Why aren't you creepy when it comes <laughs> yeah, to sales? <laughs> but there there was a, a moment which you did on purpose, but I wanna know what uh, you're gonna say, it doesn't matter, it's all about behavior, but I wanna understand no, what you yeah. think about this. Yeah. So you intentionally took people on an emotional roller coaster ride where you start, I'm gonna give you this for free and I'm gonna give you this, but if I ask you, or sorry, I'm gonna give you this, uh, normally goes for this much yeah. and this normally goes for this much, but you're crossing it out. Classic thing where you yeah. then ask for money. Now you could see the comments coming through at the time and yeah. people turned on you. Totally. And I'm assuming they were saying something akin to, I knew it, this yeah. guy is just after money, whatever. Um, if there's nothing wrong with sales, why did they turn on you? Uh, actually, so I don't know why they turned on me. I can make a guess, but at the end of the day, like I'm never going to know what the main but reason you was. You knew they were going to. You I had did a, that on purpose. I had a, I had a, I don't know why I knew that. So when people see this thing, um, there is an aversive reaction to it in a certain percentage of the population. That being said, I got a zillion messages of people being like, dude, I was ready to give you my credit card mm -hmm. at 5K. And so, Sure, like we could have taken $50 million at the event, um, but what I wanted was, you know, $500 million of value to many people that later will come through companies that get started and scaled using the stuff and then they want to partner with us. Um, but the reason that I did it was, or at least this was my hope for doing it, was that I wanted people to remember it. And so memory is driven by emotion. Um, and so I, uh, I took this roller coaster approach uh, because I also wanted to subvert the audience. If I just said, hey, it's all free, it's all amazing, here it is, I don't think nearly as many people would have talked about uh, the thing. I also don't think they would have perceived the value as high. Um, so I wanted to sell them on the value of this thing and then give it to them rather than just saying, if I got on and said, hey guys, uh, there's a free course with eight different things in there that are, you know, I spent a lot of time on, go enjoy them. I mean, it would have been fine. People would be like, you're amazing. Uh, but doing it this way, it becomes a, like, I think a lot about this is like, what is that person going to tell the next person? Like, what words are they going to say? They're probably going to be like, dude, he did this like fake pitch. And he like, and he like, everybody was going left. And then all of a sudden he made it all free. It was unreal. Like, the, like the place went nuts like that. They will remember. And um, that was what I was going for. I figured there was a higher likelihood that they would remember it if I did it that way. Yeah, I think you are very correct about that. Um, talk to me more about your mission. Mm-hmm. So, um, and I, I want, I like to put this big disclaimer out up front. I am a, a ruthless capitalist. I am absolutely here to make money. I am not a saint. I have no, like many nice things were said about me after the event. And I also remember that the same people also threw stones at me 30 seconds earlier. So like that doesn't sway me a ton, but I'm letting everybody know I'm here to make money. I'm just measuring how I make my money over a longer time horizon. Mm. That's all it is. And so. I could have taken $50 million, you know, from, from the event. I think that's a really realistic number. Um, but if I do one deal from somebody of the now probably million something people who have just even just seen the event recording or were there live, um, I will probably make more than $50 million and also get a brand that continues to compound at a faster rate. And so, to be clear, I don't think there's anything wrong with monetizing an audience. I don't think there's anything wrong. Um, it really comes down to keeping promises. So like, for example, like I, I will probably be launching some product at some point uh, in, the, in the future. Um, Whatever could that be? Yeah. 
<laughs> and um, I don't think that I will have any negative response to it. And so it really just comes down to like, what have you promised or what expectations have you set? And then are you meeting those expectations? And so I think my, my view on this has shifted a little bit over time is I used to think like you have to exceed expectations. But now I think that it's really just like, can you perfectly meet the expectations the person has? Now, somebody might have really high expectations, um, but you try and set them and meet them. And you do that cycle as many times as you can so that their predictive measure of trust with you, if you want to operationalize that, um, is that you are trustworthy because you keep your promises. And so I think that's a lot where, uh, like, the only, the other reason is that within the, unfortunately, within the, the course creation world, this is one man's two cents, all right? And I want to be really clear about this because people get their pennies in a bunch. You can choose to feed your family whatever way you need to. I have zero judgment on it. What I do acknowledge is that people make associations. And so I could find the most ethical porn business in the entire world. As soon as I stand on stage, and talk about our porn company, I will forever be associated with porn. Is there anything wrong with that? Yes or no? I don't know. For me, I think that there is uh, there are other businesses that I would like to do that I would like to do a deal with that might view that negatively, and so it might prevent me from doing a much bigger deal in the future by having that. And so I won't do it not out of principle, but out of pure dollars and cents materialism, if you want to call it that. And so. Um, the course world to that point has a lot of charlatans and a lot of people who make promises and break promises and a lot of people who set bad expectations or unrealistic expectations and then people get really frustrated and upset um, over what they get and so for me even if i had the best course in the world i wouldn't want to sell the information because it would associate me with that group. And so I've taken a lot of time to disassociate myself with that category. Um, and it was because, I, I mean, I was a brick and mortar owner, but like I learned a lot of direct response marketing in that world. So I made a lot of friends in that world who then make, made commentary and then put me on stages. And so I had a really strong associations early on with that community. Not, again, nothing wrong with that community. I'm saying, but the associations that I would prefer to have with my brand are the ones that I said earlier, which might seem in direct conflict with that, which is like, long-term oriented, enterprise value, being patient, giving first. Like these are all things that all, many people in that community, not all, but many people. And in that instance, especially with branding, in my opinion, the good apples do get thrown out with the bad. So I do absolutely think that there are amazing education businesses that exist. Absolutely. Like bar none, period, end of statement. There are just so many that aren't that it's very difficult to make the association. And so that's why I think that if I had let's say a no strip that I was going to come out with, or I had a dessert company that I was going to come out with. I don't think anyone would have any issue supporting that or me saying like, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to build this with you guys. I'll build this in public. I think these are all things that people would be totally fine with, but why it's because of the expectations that I set at the beginning. And so acting in accordance with that over a long period of time. And to one sub note on that is that I do believe that brands can change over time. And so, the concept we we're talking about earlier with like successive approximation, where like if you are one shade to the right, one shade to the right, one shade to the right, you can slowly move a brand. Uh, now, whenever you make that move, you will lose some people who liked the thing that you had before, and you will gain some people that like the new thing. And the idea of repositioning or, you know, directing a brand is making sure that that trade off is positive. It's like, uh, it's like the local band that, you know, has that local, mm -hmm. you know, vibe, whatever. And then they, they go a little bit more mainstream. And then all their early fans are like, they sold out. But what they really did was they trade a small group of people for a much larger group of people. And more people like this brand than the old brand, because if they liked the old brand, they would have already been big. And so it's really just a calculated trade on what you're willing to associate with that more people will have a positive, strong association with to make it increasingly likely that they will do what you would like them to do that helps you with your long-term goal. Mm -hmm. So zooming in on your the mission of your company, yeah. which is to make entrepreneurship accessible or business, business. Access, accessible yeah. to everyone. Yeah. Um, you have a quote, which um, I think is really, really interesting. Uh, businesses solve problems. Businesses make the world better. There are too many problems for any one person to solve. I wanna help create as many businesses as possible so we can solve as many problems as we can. What are some of the problems that you think business can solve? I mean, I would probably have a shorter list of problems that businesses can't solve. Interesting. Yeah. In a world where entrepreneurship is not always celebrated and capitalism is often vilified, yeah. um, is that 
just a contrarian stance or do you think that people are a little crazy to not see the value of business? So if we were to zoom all the way out and just think about the economy as a whole as allocation of resources, just time, energy, money, et cetera, um, capitalism in and of itself is the is a is a system about efficiently allocating capital. Now, there are trade-offs with that because if you have a pure capitalistic society, then there are a lot of other things that we say are important to us, like we believe people should have healthcare, we believe people should have a place to live, we believe people should have education and you know services for their kids when they're younger, whatever it is, right? Um, we have these beliefs, and so we make trades based on that pure idea of capitalism, because capitalism can absolutely be pure. But most, actually, I don't know of an economy right now that's a true, pure capitalist, because most humans say that that market is too ruthless. And so we're willing to make some trades and that's where legislation where we actually artificially move the incentives of the market to incentivize certain behaviors. The problem with um, governments as an allocation vehicle for capital is that they are one tenth as efficient as private because it's not their money and they never earned it. And so you get really good at capitalism by allocating resources well and getting a return on your resources you don't get you it's very hard to get fired in the government and you manage billions and billions of dollars and the requirements to get in are not as high as they are to spend even a modicum of that kind of money in the private sector and so you just have to be more efficient with what you have because you have to survive every day rather than having a guaranteed stipend from the whole country that gets taken off the top before everyone sees their paycheck and so um if government can solve it private sector can solve it better, faster, cheaper. The only real issues come into how much regulation do we put on top to, to prevent bad actors? Or what, I mean, that's the whole concept around, I mean, you know this, I'm just saying for the audience, uh, around like why we try and break up monopolies, which now we've just given up on because they're bigger than governments. Uh, but we, we do that because we want to protect, you know, we want the capital society, competition in general is good for society, tough for the competitors. But if you have 10 dry cleaning stores, the best dry cleaning store will win, and then everyone gets better dry cleaning. So it's good for society, it's bad for the nine guys who fail. And so um, I do think that entrepreneurship is the way that we solve problems. And I think that there's usually an innovative way to solve any problem if we have enough knowledge uh, to do so. I mean, and Elon's proving that with kind of first principles approach to like, can I, can I launch rockets at a tenth the price? Well, where do we get our metal from, right? Like what is required for a rocket? It's like, we have to get this from here to here. Let's build from there, right? Rather than like, well, we have to go for this guy who's our contractor for space navigation. Well, why can't we make space navigation? Well, you know, like, and then they get into the, and then the prices expand. And so that is my TLDR is that I can't learn everything. Everyone has a unique life. They are uniquely, uh, positioned to tackle opportunities that I only have one lifetime to live. And I might be able to solve two or three big problems in my lifetime, maybe. But if everybody has these skills, then I think when I die, I will be proud of the meta contribution, even if I don't capture all of the economics, because I'm going to then die and then someone else will have it and it doesn't even matter anyways. <laughs> and so I, I, there's an element of that that just makes me feel good about it, that drives me forward like the 17 year old who's going to sleep with the book under his pillow to serve, you know, provide for his family with the one goat they have. Um, I think that if I can equip that guy, that he can do whatever, like he can solve problems that I never could. Um, and so I don't think it's my life purpose to build the next rocket or cure cancer. I just don't think that's in my skill set. It's also not in my interests, but I think I can help equip the entrepreneurs who will. I love that, man. I hope more people hear that message about business. I think that to your point about, serving people in a more efficient way in a way that they prefer is so powerful and to watch it slowly get villainized of, as i've gotten older has really been sad and yeah. i think will lead us down a super dark path tell me for those that are just listening and aren't watching across the bridge of your nose on a nose strip it yeah. says the one of zero yeah be one of zero excuse me uh what does that mean so one of our kind of big themes in our content creation at Mosey Media is one of one content, or it was one of one content, meaning I don't want to do a breakdown of Coca-Cola's business model, because literally anyone could do that. That's a book report, a college kid could do that, anybody could do that. And so I only want to make content that I can make. And so one of my big rules of advertising is show what only you can show and say what only you can say. And so if you're the, the only triple black belt something in your local area, 
then say that and then also show what you can do that other people can't do. And if you don't have that reality, you either need to niche down and make it a much a narrow thing that only you can do, or you get better and can beat more people and you expand it. But that's fundamentally, anyone can become a category of one if you go narrow enough and then you just continue to expand over time. So the one of one uh, content was the concept that we've adhered to. Now, as the team started to see what was gonna happen for the event and how much we were putting into it and all the free stuff we were gonna give away, um, and how much money we were choosing actively to not make. They were like, dude, no one would do this. They're like, this is even one of one. They're like, this is one of zero. And it was like, that's it. For 18 months, I've been looking for like uh, a saying or an ism that was short and could encapsulate many of the values, skills that can be learned uh, that I believe are important. And that one of zero concept, which I love, because also from a math perspective, one of zero, you know, one divided by zero is undefined. And so it's really about being beyond definition, writing your own path, you know, keeping promises in a world that breaks them, delaying expectations, giving first and giving over and over again until they ask, or even if they never ask. And trying to live your life in a way that you earn your own approval by the end of it. And I think that's what one of zero is all about. And so for me, be one of zero. And that's a, that is a brand that I, I really want to stand behind because that's what I believe. I love it. Where can people follow you? You're listening to this on audio. Both my books are free on my podcast. The leads book and the offers audiobook are on my podcast. You can just listen to them. You don't have to, you don't have to opt in. It's just right there. You can, you can listen to them. I love it. All right, everybody, speaking of things that you will love, if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe. And until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care. Peace. Check out this interview with my friend Peter Diamandis about AI and the future of business and technology. You said that the next billion dollar company will be founded by three people. How is that possible? First of all, I would just say that we're living in a different day and age. The ability to start companies to